Do you remember one time, this is over two and a bit years ago, uh, in episode 46, titled The Japanese Dentist? John, you told us a story about how a Japanese dentist misspelt your name as Joho. Yes, it's the title that I earned in Glorious Nippon. And I guess as a recurring joke, then you renamed yourself on Facebook as Joho. That's true. Uh, Cross a, I was Joho was my like internet name before I patch wolf. So you went to a con called Magfest. Yes, it was your first ever Magfest. Yes, and you would have went to this, I guess, at at at, at either the beginning of 2015 or the beginning of 2016. I think it was 2015. Is Maybe. this an Inquisition? Oh yes. Oh okay. no, really? Oh fuck, are we finally doing this? This is episode 100, John's intervention. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, yeah. So, Brian's referring to a story about a very strange experience I had in MAGFest. Uh, Basically, I applied for like an artist alley table in MAGFest, and I really didn't think I was going to get it, but I ended up getting it, which means that I decided to fly to Washington by myself and sell at a con and it was a really good experience and I had a really fun time but it was also very strange um I'd never been to I hadn't been to like America by myself before and so like I was really unprepared in a lot of ways so when I got off the airplane I had like 10% left on my battery and I had no idea where I was meant to go and so I had to like run and get a taxi before my phone ran out and like because that was the only way I could Google Maps it and I had to show the taxi driver and the taxi driver was this really lovely Eastern European guy but he was also really scary because like the entire way there he was telling me about all the awful, awful neighborhoods that are around here and he's like, man, I've picked up so many people and I dropped them off where they're meant to be staying and it's like a nightmare (laughs) and I'm like, Jesus Christ and like at this point, it's like 8 p.m. at night. It's getting dark. I can't see anything out the window. I can see that some of the neighborhoods we're driving through are really rough and like America rough. And that's frightening. And so I'm so fucking scared. But we keep going anyway. And he tells me these like just horror stories, like stuff that I honestly don't want to repeat on this podcast because it's too scary. And I'm, I'm just like, I'm going to die. I'm like, I'm actually going to die. But we keep going anyway, and eventually we like drive through all the rough areas, and we come to a really nice estate, and it's full of like all these villas and stuff. And at this point, like I haven't slept in like twenty hours. I'm really out of it. I'm in a different country. I'm quite scared. And we pull up to the place, and the taxi driver goes, "Okay, John, we've kind of established a rapport at this point." And he's like, "Okay, John, I'm gonna go check this house just to make sure it's okay." And I'm like, okay, because I'm looking at it, and it's a big, gigantic villa. This is an Airbnb that I decided to book into, and it was a fraction of the cost of all the hotels around, which I thought was a little weird, but I was like, okay, no, it's all right. I don't really know what to think anymore, because I'm so out of it and so freaked out by this guy's stories. So anyway, he goes up, I see him go around the corner, and then he comes back nearly immediately, and he's like, he comes to the car, and he goes, yeah, it's fine. And I'm like, oh... Okay. And so I get my luggage, I pay him, a really nice guy, he says, bye, good luck. And I go up to the door, and next thing, this really lovely Jamaican woman comes out in a dressing gown, and she just goes, Joho, welcome! And I was like, Joe? And again, I, my state of mind, I was not fully lucid. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, hey, Pamela, because that was meant to be her name. And she's like, come in, come in. It's so good to meet you, Joho. You're from Ireland. And she starts talking to me. And in my head, I'm like, okay, you have to correct her like immediately because this will go on for the entire week. But I swear to God, okay, I go in and as soon as I do, there's this giant fucking banner above their kitchen that says, Joho, welcome to MAGFest. <laughs> And I'm like, oh my god. And I'm just kind of stunned, and I'm, I'm trying to think of something to say. And she goes, oh, and here's my, here's my husband, Keith. 
And this guy comes out, Keith, this massive dude from Cincinnati, really, really lovely. And he goes, Joe Ho, how's it going? And he shakes my hand. And I'm like, hey, Keith, great to meet you. And in my head, I'm like, I, I guess I'm Joe Ho for the week. And so anyway, they're both talking to me and they're both asking like so many questions. And I'm kind of like, this is weird. And I'm f- I'm also fucking so hungry at this point because like you know hadn't done a long term had, like hadn't done a long flight by myself I f- forgot that like eating would be a thing and I am starved and so I go are you hungry and I'm like yeah actually I'm really hungry and I'm like is there any takeaways I could order here and like oh, no they're they're like no we'll get you some food we'll get you some food and Keith the husband drives out and buys me like this big like luxurious Chinese takeaway during which like Pam is asking me questions the entire time and I'm like this is amazing this place cost me like 300 bucks for the week and I'm like this is awesome and they take me over to their fridge and they go okay see this fridge and they're kind of stern and I'm like yeah and they're like you can eat anything in this fridge and I'm like wow this is so good and I swear to god the bacon from that fridge was the best thing I've ever eaten it was like I put that shit in my mouth and it was like I could see the fucking inside of the universe it was so good Irish bacon is trash compared to this stuff so then anyway eventually I'm like I'm really tired I should probably go to bed so they take me up to my bedroom and they walk me into the largest room I have ever seen in my life it was gigantic and the bed was like it was like two king beds pushed together like i could run across this bed and i lie down and it's so comfortable and i'm going to sleep and i'm just kind of thinking what the fuck is happening and then i just pass out and i wake up the next morning anyway and again everything is so nice and the house is so clean and it's full of like all these like really expensive art pieces and it's just a giant villa and I'm like what's going on but there's some weird stuff right because that morning or that like very early that morning at like 3 a.m I wake up because I'm all jet lagged and fucked up and I go downstairs to the kitchen and I can see a light coming from the kitchen and I go in and Pamela is just standing there but the fridge is open and she's just staring into the fridge. And I, I don't want to sneak up on her, so I just go, hey, Pamela. She doesn't react at all. She just keeps staring into the fridge. And I get really freaked out, so I just go back to bed. And I'm like, there is something happening here. And during the time, all these weird little like clues keep dropping, right? There's one bit where... um. I go, I'm talking to Pamela, and I think I was just saying something like, oh, what does Keith do? And she just goes, Keith. Oh, Keith, yeah, Keith. um, (laughs) And then she starts telling me about Keith's job. And then I actually get really friendly with these two, and they're very nice, but I'm driving around with Keith at one point, and I'll get to why later. And his phone rings, and it says, like, Caitlin. And, like, I see the screen, it says Caitlin, and then he picks it up and he goes, Hey, Pamela, how's it going? So Keith and Pamela are fake names they're using. Just like my name wasn't real, their name was also not real. Were they still referring to you as Joho? Yes. At this stage, yes. so you never got Never to- corrected okay. them. <laughs> it was too late. It, it was, was too late. The moment I saw the sign, it was too late. And so this is because you set up your Airbnb account. Off my Facebook. Off your Facebook, and so it synced that data across. Yes. And you... You just never fixed it. Why didn't you just say, Joho's my nickname, you can call me John? Because I'm an idiot, Neve. Is that what you want to fucking hear? Yeah, pretty much. Go on, continue. So anyway, something isn't right here. Like, I ate more than $300 food while I was there. They are not making money. Look, Brian, you've been on holiday with me, you know how it is. I I know exactly how it is. Yep. Uh, This, something was weird here, okay? So... Then, on, like, the second last day, it clicks. Keith asked me, is there... No, actually, this was was earlier in the holiday. Keith asked me, is there anywhere I want to go? And I was like, you know what? I want to go to Taco Bell. Because I've never been before, and I wanted to try it. And he's like, there's a Taco Bell near here, but tell you what, I'll go with you. And I was like, okay. And so he drives me out to the Taco Bell, 
the Taco Bell was in a very rough neighborhood, and it was the kind of neighborhood where a little Irish boy in an anime t-shirt would stand out a lot, okay? You don't get you don't get neighborhoods like this in Ireland. And there was a lot of people sitting around the Taco Bell with no food in front of them, just sitting there. And I felt really, like, intimidated because these were rough dudes and they were, like, staring at me. And so I went up, I ordered my Taco Bell. I didn't, I was, like, too scared to remember even what I order. And so I go over and I'm like, okay, I'll get a Coke as well. And I go over to the Coke machine and I press the button and the Coke machine goes, like, and then just like a drop of sludge hits the bottom of my drinks cup and I go back and you know what I fucking do I go back to my table and I drink some of it because (laughs) I don't know what else to do and so during this entire and so then anyway Keith who's there with me takes like not joking about four minutes to order he asks so many questions at the counter and then finally he comes to me and so we're kind of chatting anyway and he's like, do you have a girl, Joho? And I was like, yeah, yeah, Michelle, we've been together for like... Johnny, two. you're not supposed to use real names. Michelle? Yeah. Why? You have to do a fake name for Michelle as well. Why? Uh, I guess I should have. Yeah, you should have. Yeah. Nancy. Nancy. Okay, so I, I say, yeah, yeah, I've been with Michelle for about nine years. And he goes, nine years! And he's like appalled. And he's like, when are you going to put a ring on that? That's what he says. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I mean, we're not like, you know, neither of us kind of are in like a stable professional. I was really surprised he asked. Then he goes, "Mm -hmm." you see, Joho, God only vilifies that which is born in his light. No. And then I get these fucking flashbacks to the house. And there's all these like framed Bible verses on the wall. And Keith and Pamela quotation marks were hyper born again Christians this super cheap super lucrative Airbnb was a way for them to convert people and from there every conversation comes back to Jesus the entire time I'm there to the point that I feel like I'm going insane j Dog is cool though yeah I mean sure but um, did you write an Airbnb review for them? I did actually. Did you mention this? Uh, I did because there's a point in the Airbnb where you can leave a comment that like the owners can't see, and I just wrote they were very nice and accommodating, but they were very religious, and I wouldn't feel comfortable bringing my LGBT friends there. I was thinking of you, Neve. <laughs> Thanks. <Yeah. laughs> But um, that was my adventure to Magfest. How, how many days did you live with them? Seven. <gasps> did, you, did you get to go to Magfest? Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> and, like, that's a whole other story I, as well. Like, I went to Magfest. I set up a table completely by myself and sold by myself for the, like, entire four days. And that is maybe the horniest con I have ever been at. It was so weird. And I've been to Magfest since then. It wasn't... It was just a horny year. It was a really horny year. What happened? Just a lot of sexual energy. A lot of sexual energy. A lot of getting invited to, like, hotel rooms and stuff, which I'm not used to. And honestly, I wouldn't even know what to fucking do. So, just... Yeah. So, what what, what, what uh, was Keith's job? Oh, okay. So, this is another thing, right? Keith asked me, did I want to come for a drive one day? And I was like, Sure. And so we were actually going for what he was in. The, what he liked to do was drive into low income housing estates and wait for people to come out of their houses and then walk up to them and offer them like 30 or 40 grand for their houses cash. <gasps> no. Yep. Oh, OK. Yeah. And. That's so fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. And so then, this was actually the very last day. And I thought we'd be, like, go out for an hour drive. We were out for four hours. And I was about to... uh, Jesus, this guy was so crazy. I was about to miss my plane home. (gasps) And he was like, 
you hungry, Joho? And I was like, no, I'm okay. And then he was like, okay, because we're going to be passing by this fish taco place, and you got to try these. And I was like, oh, Keith, my flight's, my flight's literally like in an hour and a half, and like I, I like to be at the airport like two hours in advance, so like I'd really like to get to the airport. And he goes, okay, we can totally get to the airport, but first we're going to get you some of them fish tacos. And then like we pull into the fucking place, he goes in, he buys like 18 fish tacos, he gives me like nine and I'm fucking walking through the airport with nine fish tacos and I don't even know what I'm fucking doing. And so I sit down in front of security and I fucking just like eat eight of them because I don't even know what else to do at that point. And then I fly home and I come back here and I start a video game podcast. Welcome to the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast episode 100. Hey everybody. Hey guys. Hey. Welcome to Let's Fight a Boss Video Game Podcast. The world's strongest video game podcast. I am sitting here with two of the best damn podcasters in the entire world. To my left, the master of microphones, the authority of audio. It's Brian. You can hear me in your loins. And to my right, mistress of hot takes, master of the opinion. I'm sorry, Neve. It's <laughs> Neve. Hi, thanks. <laughs> and with you always, I am your host, Josh. <laughs> it's Joho. Joho. <laughs> so what you got? Joho, Josh, Jam. Do you have any other names? Joe, Josh, Jam. Um, my mom calls me Joss. <laughs> like Joss Whedon? Not like Joss Whedon. Are you, are you yeah. sure? Well, like I guess, yeah, but I don't think my mom knows who Josh Sweden is. Josh Sweden. <laughs> Josh Sweden. Okay, that's my new name. Josh Sweden. I'm happy with that one. <laughs> I actually think we didn't start the podcast long after that happened. Um... By my mental calculations, this was MAGFest 2016. Yeah. So, or maybe, well, no. Have you not really... Because no, I've been to four MAGFests. Then, we've been going for four years. Yeah. Okay, well, then it was MAGFest 2015 yeah. that you went. Fuck. So, MAGFest 2015 was the horny MAGFest. Yes. Um, People were putting out the con. I mean, you know... More, more power to them. Like I wasn't grossed out or anything. I was just like, ha ha, boy, I'm out of my depth. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a hell of a trip. But a hundred episodes. A hundred episodes. We've been around for one hundred episodes. I really feel like we could have done something better with the time. Like, it's taken us four years to get to episode one hundred because the first episode was the E tree special in 2015 where we didn't have a name no and that was it, th that's episode that episode's in the black tapes isn't it oh no it, it, oh, oh, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. You, you can absolutely listen to that um but that was recorded at the end of june and we're here at the end of may now or well in the latter half of may almost four years later and we've done 100 episodes it's going to take us four more years to get to 200 episodes do you think we'll get there I, I would say no just because that's I don't I, I, I don't see myself like living in four years but also I never in a million years would have thought we would have got to 100 episodes and I definitely never thought we would have gotten to like four years four years like that's crazy it's insane it does not feel that long it really all. doesn't the, like the boss cast to me still feels like something new in my life yeah like we started it six months ago I don't think I've told everyone I do a podcast yet. Yeah. They know, but I don't know. Yeah. And that's, I think, why I get, like, such a shock sometimes when I see the numbers we do. And, like, see that, like... Like, Neve, you were saying, I think, the other day, something about, like, another, like, really popular podcast. And then it turns out, like... We yeah. I was listening to a podcast that I like, and they were talking about their numbers. And, like, this is a pretty popular one. And they get, like, called out uh, and recommended a lot. And I was just like, wait, we hit those numbers. Are we a podcast? Ain't no one recommending the Let's Fight a Boss cast. No, there are, there are on Twitter. There's some nice folk. Oh, yeah. I check it. I check to make sure we get some shout outs. 
that's good thank you everyone for for shouting out your podcast and i hope people i hope people are, are still happy listening to this 100 episodes in yeah no thank you so much for listening to this and if if if, if you hate listening to us thank you so much for sticking with us hey bro. buddy listen you do you you know it's okay it's okay to hate stuff uh, i i want to see that thumbs down yeah Everything. oh man yeah when sometimes when we don't get that like one or two thumbs down an episode, I'm like, where are they? Like, are they okay? <laughs> I really hope they support the Patreon as well, just so they can listen to the older episodes we took off. <laughs> so they're like, mm, I fucking hate these guys. Sometimes I like to, I like to look at like I like to post a video and then just look at the first few comments because they're the weirdest fucking shit in the world. Like they're so they're always like the most morbid, most perverse comments. They're so bizarre. And some one of my favorites was one last time someone just said, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, that's really weird for, like, posting, like, a 30-minute video and you hit refresh and there's already comments. Because, like, they haven't watched the video. Oh, immediately. And, like, you know, about 40 or 50. And, you know, a lot of them are, like, really enjoyed this video. Keep it up. And it's like, you fucking liar. <laughs> so, guys, what say we enter our media section of the podcast that we don't really have proper detective pikachu who it, saw it? it's called the quest log the quest log our 100th quest log yeah detective pikachu uh have we all seen detective pikachu i have seen no. detective pikachu if you haven't seen detective pikachu no why not i don't care i didn't care either i love it should i care should i see detective pikachu it's come a on good, tell it's, me do your thing yeah okay <laughs> neve you love nintendo <laughs> yeah off to a good start you, you like being happy you also think that Pokemon is like the best JRPG. <laughs> it's not a JRPG. It is absolutely... I, okay, I wanted to drag this argument out into the light for one second because I want people to hear how insane Neve is. I'm not even going to argue, <laughs> Neve, to explain to people why Pokemon isn't a JRPG. Oh, this no, this conversation's too annoying because you're being... You're willfully okay, ignoring... Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, so this is me dragging both of you out. This is what it's like to be in a room with both Neve and John. So I think if a party has me or Neve, the party is infinitely better. If the party has me and Neve, infinitely worse. Infinitely better. Because Any, it's infinitely worse. I, I, I think I've had birthday parties ruined by both of you just like having a civil conversation. Yep. Awful, awful fucking words. <laughs> okay, tell me why the movie's good. It doesn't have Nido Queen in it, so I don't care. It, it's, there missing, we go. it's missing a lot of like. It, it, it's got about 60 Pokemon in it. A lot of them are the original generation, the, sprinkled with a few more recent. I, th- I thought the spread of Pokemon was pretty good. Honestly. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It, like it, I, I would have liked to get like a Scyther in there. That would have been fun. I, I thought Gengar looked fucking weird. Yeah, it like was, it was great. maybe a little too much because you know the way like for most of the Pokemon they backed it just up to where they start looking freakish and then just kind of pulled it back maybe a couple of decibels. With Gengar, they just shot right over. Gengar was showing a lot of teeth. A lot of teeth and gum. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, my favorite part of this movie is basically the first half is it's just this kind of noir-style story. Yeah, it's pretty much film noir. Like, it's yeah. all filmed at night and everything. Yeah, and it's just... It all takes place in a city at night where the Pokemon all have jobs. You could literally rip out the plot of this movie and just... Show me a city full of Pokemon and them all doing their thing because the Pokemon in this movie are so good and so well rendered that they literally excuse anything other anything else that I felt like the film does wrong. Like any criticism I have of this movie is immediately countered by but the Pokemon. <laughs> I really, really like the location that it's a fusion of England with a bit of Japan, so it kind of feels like um, Piccadilly Circus in London mixed with Shibuya but it also has like open street markets and it's just it like it, it's really fucking cool it's really cool and the lighting like there was so much really nice lighting in it yeah and um, I just the level of expression and animation in, in like the Pokemon there were so many Pokemon every shot like in every shot you could just comb through it and just notice all these little details and the Pokemon doing all this little thing and it was so much fun and like I I saw this on my opening on like the opening weekends because I wanted to go there and I wanted to see the fucking Pokemon weeaboos I wanted to see all these dudes in their fucking mid-30s who care about Pokemon way too much 
And then the film starts, and the first Pokemon they show is Mewtwo, and in my sea, I go, <gasps> and that was a harrowing moment of realization. And um, that 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 you were the biggest piece. Of I shit w- I room. was the biggest piece of shit. I went to there to see some human garbage, and when I got to my sea, it was just a mirror. But um, I genuinely really enjoyed the movie. What's it about? What's the plot? Um, okay, so. It stars Justice Smith, who is an aspiring insurance agent. Yes. Doesn't really like Pokemon, kind of has a, a troubled past with them. And I really liked that, because for ages in Pokemon games, I've really just wanted to meet that one character who's like, I don't actually like Pokemon. I wish people wouldn't always talk about them. Because everyone you talk about in Pokemon has something to say about Pokemon. Yeah, so like this guy, like he doesn't outright hate Pokemon. He's just, I, I don't want to think about them all the fucking time. Yeah. Which his, is kind of difficult in the world. His dad was way too wink into Pokemon. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, no, I'm actually interpreting that as something oh, else. Oh, no. Uh, no, I know exactly what it is. Okay. Um, Here's your new mom, Gardevoir. <laughs> um, so he is goes... Pikachu his dad? <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, cool. It's not what I was going for there. But <laughs> uh. Yeah, so so he goes to the big city because his dad, who is a detective, has gone missing. His yep. dad was a detective? Yep. Okay. And, and you... <laughs> I think we might need to edit this. I, I think everyone's seen Detective Pikachu at this point. Sure, okay. Look, oh. I'll, I'll just say spoilers for Detective Pikachu and the, the fucking thing. Okay. Um, cool. And do you know what? Caught me off guard. <laughs> I was like, no way! Because I fucking believed. I sat down and I believed they were fucking real. Yeah. He, um, yeah so. Ryan Reynolds is fantastic as Pikachu, and the animation of Pikachu is fantastic, like, playing up Ryan Reynolds' voice. It works so well. When, like, in my cinema, when Pikachu came on screen, the entire cinema went like, oh! Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just won them over yeah, right away. immediately. And, um, so he's the partner of your dad, who's the detective. So this is Detective Pikachu. Mm-hmm. And he wears a little deerstalker hat. And He's addicted to coffee. He loves his coffee. And he's and it's Ryan Reynolds. And he's just improvising. And I, I think Ryan Reynolds is very funny. He's very funny. Yeah. And... There's some, there's, some, there's some great bits. For some reason, they have the movie from Home Alone on TV at one point. That was so strange, because that's not a real movie. Yeah, it's not. What? You, you know the you movie know the, that Kevin McAllister yeah. watches? Dirty animals. Why yeah. would they put Keep that Keep the in change, there? you filthy yeah, animal. Yeah, yeah. What's the connection? Is it the same nope. studio? It's just playing oh, on no, TV I, I, at I, one I, point. I, I think this is distributed by Warner. And don't didn't they do Home... I, I, I'm pretty sure they did. But why? It's just some weird fake movie that they use. I feel like there's some like clever joke in there that we're not getting. <laughs> I don't know. But um, So anyway, then he meets up with this reporter whose partner is a Psyduck. The Psyduck is also amazing. He's very good. Um, do you know the Psyduck is voiced by Hugh Laurie? <laughs> okay. That's not true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, and oh, I think we should each tell a lie this episode. Okay, well that's my lie, and I got you both. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought the acting of the of the lead dude and the lead girl really bad. Really? Yeah. So you're not there for the humans at all. It's oh for God! The no, for the Pokemon. no, they're, they're they 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 are purely a vehicle for more dialogue for Detective Pikachu to talk to. Yeah, and like their characters don't have anything amazing going on, but like the actors, maybe 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 it's not the actors, maybe it was the direction. Like I don't know. I, I like Bill Nighy as the the man, <laughs> Evolution Man. He, yeah, no, he was all right, and um, oh, his dad's old partner. He was. He's been in a bunch of stuff. Really cool Asian actor. Oh, Ken Watanabe. Ken Watanabe. Yeah, he's yeah. really, really good. He's in Godzilla. That yeah, disappointing Godzilla that movie. Very but, disappointing Godzilla. But, but he's also in Last Samurai, and he's good in that. Yeah, but um, I the first half of this movie, I like kind of loved it. I really, really thought it was great. And then in the second half, it kind of it goes some places that. Some of it works, some of it maybe not so much. Second half has the Bulbasaur bit. I like that bit. 
See, I didn't like that because isn't Bul- like Bulbasaur should have a little crank to him. He should, but the only Pokemon that sounds like the Pokemon is Pikachu during that one bit where other people hear him and they actually bring back the woman who voices Pikachu. Yeah. But every other Pokemon has a new voice for the film. But it was a very nice Bulbasaur and I feel like Bulbasaur should be a bit grumpy. That's the Bulbasaur I like. Bulbasaur is nice when there's trouble. My Bulbasaur knows when it's time to fucking step up and make the effort. I I think maybe you just don't understand Bulbasaur, Brian. I really understand Bulbasaur, Brian. Mm. (laughs) Um, it was a really good movie. Uh, I, I had a great time with it, and I was really surprised at how much I enjoyed it. And it really, like, kind of... It kind of reminded me, like, of how I used to feel about Pokemon, because I'm really yeah, burned sure. out on Pokemon, and I'm not... It's not really a thing for me anymore, you know? Yeah. And it really brought me back to the days of, like, you know, couldn't wait to see the Pokemon cartoon on Sky, like, every evening and stuff. So, yeah. It was great. I really, really enjoyed it. Probably the best film of 2019. Probably the best film of 2019. Or is it? No. I don't know. Brian, why don't you tell us about... Greta. Greta. Do you guys know about Greta? Do you know about this, Neil? This is Neil Jordan's new film, the Irish film director that makes a film. Usually they're not very good. Sometimes they're they're good, though. (laughs) (laughs) You're selling me. Yeah. So this is in the latter half. This is one of his good films. Like he made uh, the, those vampire movies, the one, the one Tom Cruise in it, and Brad Pitt. Oh, Hitt. Interview with a Vampire. Yeah, he made that. I haven't that. seen oh. that in forever. Oh. Uh, he directed that, and he also directed one with Saoirse Ronan that came out a couple of years ago. I don't know the name of any of his films. He made The Crying Game, which did well at the time. I don't know how. I don't know if that film has aged well. It has not aged well. <laughs> I mean, a lot of great acting in that movie hasn't aged well. Great. Uh, so Greta it stars Chloe Grace Moretz, you know, who played Hit Girl and stuff like that. And it stars this French actress called Isabelle Hubert. And it's just about a young girl in New York who befriends an older woman in New York. And it's about their relationship. That's all I want to say. I highly recommend this movie if you want to watch something that's a scream with your close partner or a small group of friends. It has some good moments to it. Uh, didn't really like the ending and there's some weird plot contrivances but when the film is good it's fucking brilliant I like films like that like I like yeah. movies where it's like it's not good all the way through but the bits that hit hard hit really hard there are some standout moments to this film I wish the rest of the film was as good as the good bits he also did Byzantium that's the one I was thinking of mm. do you like that film? yeah um, it's kind of shitty but it's kind of good it's yeah, a vampire it, movie as well yeah and he also made Michael Collins because th- someone had to make that movie in the 90s <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the best, the best of the best you can get from Ireland, Neil Jordan. Everyone <laughs> gets the Brian thumbs up. Yeah, no, it it get it gets a lukewarm, like kind of wobbly thumbs up. Neve, tell us about Gentleman Jack. Gentleman Jack is a HBO BBC. Oh, show. weird. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of it aired first in the the US last month, and it's like five episodes in, and it aired like 30 last week in the UK. It is about Anne Lister, who is a real life, well, was a real life person who existed in 1832 and is known as the modern, the first modern lesbian. And we know about this and we, the show is based on Anne Lister's diaries and she was like a serial diary (laughs) diarist. (laughs) It's pronounced diarist. A modern day (laughs) blogger. She was a modern gay blogger. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She started from the age of seven and wrote up until when she died. And she like meticulously wrote about every aspect of her life. And what she, she wrote, like, I think it was like four million words by the mm. time she had died. Um, when, and what she also wrote about in a hidden alphabet in code uh, that was made using a mix of algebra and Greek was about her lesbian relationships that she also had from a very young age all her life. She was very, very... There was no word for lesbian at this stage. There was, like, there was no word for gay, you know. Um, She was known as a jack, which would, at the time, would have been, like, the closest thing to a dyke. And she refused to enter into lavender. I feel, feel, feel like Jack's a nicer. nicer yeah, term. oh, totally. Let's go back to that. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, she refused to go into a lavender marriage where it's just like, you know, two people of the same persuasion would get married to, you know, for social cover. Uh, and she really wanted to live her life as her, like, as herself and her most true self and loving women. And the TV show Gentleman Jack is about a space in her life. Uh, it's set in Halifax in the UK. And it's about like around a four year period of her life where she is trying to woo a wealthy lady into being her lady for love forever. And it's great. It, like, it's really, I, I really am enjoying it. It's, it's kind of fascinating to see what it was back then because like no one has a word for it and they want to kind of express like people find out her secret and she's like really an, an eccentric woman and she dresses all black and like she's a top hat. Yeah, she's really confident and in control. Yeah. In every scene that she's in. It's like way like she she was she was from a wealthy family. She inherited an estate uh, and she was a landlord. And she's not like she's not pretending to be anything other than just a woman who's into women. Yeah. That's but you see the thing is she like this is a time when women like couldn't be educated and stuff and she was a smart woman who <laughs> made sure she was educated and went traveling the world and could talk rings around people so anytime she was accused of something she'd nearly put it back on the person and be kind of like what do you mean how could this even work you know she would like get them to try and say stuff but there was no words to say things so she could easily slip out of confrontations about her sexuality that's really interesting yeah she was like she she was a very clever clever woman um the show itself like it's great it's set on location it's like in halifax it is her it's sheldon hall her home that she lived uh and lived and died in um it's kind of because it's based on her diaries there's a little bit of fourth wall breaking to kind of just to kind of point that it is her talking to you all the time like this is a direct feed that you have uh, apart from her kind of lesbian uh, liaisons the other stuff that ha- is happening is like kind of local small town politics a guy who's like been stealing her coal injured like you know a tenant <laughs> just like just small minutia of town but always her pushing at people and prodding at people a little bit much that you're kind of a little afraid of her a little afraid for her that's exactly what you're like Neve. yeah she was like the OG or like lesbian fuckboy you know when <laughs> you know when Neve has like two or three drinks and she starts get, she starts asking the questions Brian yeah she, she gets fucking yeah. notions and do you ever just you know wonder <laughs> you know what would you do if someone just cut off your hands? <laughs> no, Neve, I don't. <laughs> well, Anne Lister is asking all the questions all the time. She's like really baller. Uh, it's a good show. I would say the first episode is not the easiest to get into. It kind of starts on a weird foot, I would say. But by the second episode, if you're not into it, then you won't be into it. But I would give it the second episode because if you are into it by that point, you're going to love it. Sure. Okay, I'll watch the second episode. Were you not into the first, Brian? No. Okay. But I will watch the second episode for Neve. And only Neve. Okay. Thank you. That's Gentleman Jack. That sounds really good. You know what else sounds really good? Final season of Game of Thrones. I I disagree with that, and I know it's a controversial opinion, but I didn't really enjoy this season. I thought it was kind of perfect, honestly. I felt like everything just kind of came together. Um... It was cool. Like uh, there was just a lot of good stuff in it. You know, it was like poetry. It just kind of rhymed. Do you know? Do you know what I'm not looking forward to about the last season of Game of Thrones? What's that? The twelve months of discourse we're going to have, and all the video essays, and then the video essays to counter those video essays, and just like a lull in conversation at some sort of like event where you kind of half know people, and it's like let's talk about something that we all saw, Game of Thrones. Yeah, I, th- I feel like that video essay discourse has already started. Great. And um, I kind of feel like everyone's on the same page with it, though. So will there be counter discourse? I've seen people disagree strongly with why it's bad. Wow. Okay. Joseph Anderson had a really interesting tweet thread about it where he was like, the two number one complaints I see about Game of Thrones are one is it's not subversive the way that previous Game of Thrones was. And two, that the character arcs don't pay off. And he's like, and he kind of made a really interesting point about how both those can't be true but he also said he didn't watch it yeah 
But he still has a, I still think that point yeah, kind of Yeah, I think he up. has a point, but I think there's like, I mean, there is a, it is a story that ended and it's like a flat ending, you know, you can kind of reverse on things that they didn't have He to. wasn't making the argument it was bad. I think he was more making the argument that like, he feels like there's a lot of hot takes coming out about why it's bad. Oh yeah, there's and, loads of hot takes. Yeah, and I think that's fair. But, um, okay, so... Can't have a hot take on the hot takes. <laughs> well, yeah. Here's 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 me and Brian's hot takes. I okay. I feel like out of a lot of people, out of what I heard from a lot of people, I was actually pretty up onto this se- up on this season pretty far in. I really liked the Battle of Winterfell. Really, really liked it. Yeah, no, it's the same. And I, there I, was I, I like a lot of, of criticism for that. And my only defense is I enjoyed it. Like, I had a really good time watching it. Um, there was, like, plot holes in it. There was stuff that, like... Why did this happen? Why was this character here? Sure, plot holes have never really bothered me that much if I'm enjoying just the core thing itself. And I really did enjoy it. I thought it was a really fun, cool episode. Like, it felt like a nightmare to me. Like, I really thought that, that things were going to go very wrong for everyone in that episode. How spoilery do we get? It's at Game this of stage, Thrones. yeah. At this stage, the, like it's been spoiled all over Twitter. I know exactly what happens, and I haven't watched any of it. I, I think we could spoil Game of Thrones. Yeah. One of the biggest things I heard about, like the Battle of Winterfell episode, was like it's stupid that Arya took down the Night King. But like to me, Arya is like the most dangerous character in Game of Thrones because she spent eight seasons becoming an assassin. So it makes sense to me that she would. She's the best person to kill the Night King. Yeah, I really... Like, people are like, oh, I want Jon Snow to kill the Night King. And it's like, okay, but that's your, like, lack of subversion. Like, the good night boy saves the day. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd actually... Yeah. I, I haven't watched any, like, the video essays about why that essay... Why that's bad. Um, And I might. I'll see. But I really did enjoy that episode. Then the following episode, episode four, I started to be like, there's something not quite right here. Like, there's something not connecting. Yeah, they're, they're making irrational, uncalculated decisions yeah. about everything. What's the name of Desert Daenerys' servant? Missande. Missande. All of a sudden, Missande is like one of the most important characters in the show. And she dies, and it's like... It's meant to be, like, this massive trigger for Daenerys to just go completely insane. I, I guess it was, like, the final push because of Jorah dying the previous episode. Yeah. And, yeah, I guess and, so. and, and, and then her dragon dying suddenly, f- just for no reason, I, I would, in the middle of that. Ep- well, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it was really weird. So then we have, like, episode five, and it's here where things completely went to shit for me. And, like, in the same way, I'd say my only defense of episode three, I enjoyed it, was that I enjoyed it. My biggest damnation of episode five was I just didn't, I wasn't into it. Like, I was kind of uninterested, and there was so much stuff in it where it was just bad. And, like, the like there's this one scene where Arya runs into this house full of people, and it's, like, the whole city is, like, like on fire. Well, not even on fire, but like being, everyone's being slaughtered by Daenerys' army. And Arya want, runs into this building and she's like, come on, we have to get out of here to all the people. But it's like, outside is way more dangerous than in the building. And so then she runs outside with them all and they all get torched. And it's like, yeah, that's what would have happened if you did that, you stupid idiot. I don't know why Arya is in that episode either. So they have someone on the ground that can be like, ah, fire. I don't know why I didn't just use Jon Snow for that. Yeah, because he was already there. I need a good reason to. Yeah, because like Arya had a good reason, and then and then because she was gonna go kill Cersei, which is what they should have done in the first place. Yeah, she's already proved she's a very good assassin. Yeah, she could have done it like hassle free. But then Sander's like, you don't have to be here, even though he could have told her that the entire way on the horse. Yeah, totally on their horse trip, and she was like, you know what, you're right. And so then she decides to leave. Can't because she has to react to a bunch of stuff. Then gets in a white horse and leaves. Next episode, no white horse. Just, that just, white horse was given more significance than major character deaths. I think people thought that was Bran warging into a horse to rescue her. Well, apparently not. <laughs> it's just some fucking horse. Yep. Fucking hell. And then the sixth episode was just 
boring. It was the, it was cleaning up a weird party. Yeah, the, the, fu- the following day. Okay, you know what bit I really liked? You know when John when John Snow is like walking up to like Daenerys's steps, and all the unsullied are to the left and to the right. And then, like, Daenerys comes over the peak of the steps and, like, the dragon's wings go out behind her. Oh, and she's got that silhouette. Fucking amazing shot. That was super... Re- co- that, like, that was incredible. I've barely seen that as, like, a gif online either. Like, it's such a cool bit. It's amazing. I've seen that everywhere. Really? Yeah. yeah. I've seen it all. That's I've seen so it. corny. Anytime that happens in anything, I think it's the corniest thing. They do it in Deus Ex with a whole pile of computers, so he's like computer angel wings. Yeah. Like they like <laughs> No, they do no, it in I Twilight thought, like, where like Edward Cullen and no, the, but see, the have, owl wings are have, behind him. <laughs> she's the angel of death. Oh, I see. And like <laughs> it's also like it's really brief, so it's only on screen for a second. Like they didn't overplay it or anything. And it, it really I like it, it worked for me a lot. But um, That's because you're edgy boys. <laughs> Well, I am. Brian's not. Brian, John, does, Brian doesn't even like V's song from from Devil May Cry. I don't. I only like Devil Trigger. Well, but we'll I get agree. to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. John John is so edgy, he's fallen off the edge like five times now. It's true. It happens, and I claw my way back up every time. Um, I don't really want to go on about it too long, because I feel like everyone is talking about this shit, and I don't, I don't think I have much to say. But, like, I am actually fine with what happened like the way the plot went in Game of Thrones it was more just how it happens that I thought sucked like the whole idea of Daenerys becoming evil and going insane yeah right that could work probably need a good solid season and a half to build up to that yeah like really like turn that slow that slow turning truck yeah that is her arc yeah don't do a fucking wrestling heel turn yeah exactly That that's what it felt like though it felt like it felt like the worst of wrestling storytelling because, like, I didn't mind that they were building up Cersei as a Mad Queen and then they subverted it by going, actually, Daenerys is the Mad Queen. That's dumb, though. What the hell is, it? like, Cersei, like, Cersei's been so that, mad that all was, the that, time. That was, like, yeah. subversion with no point. Yeah, because, like, cause, like, the previous, well, like, the one back at the end of season three was that we thought Rob Stark was going to, like, save the day. And then the subversion was that, you know, he got killed at the Red Wedding. And then, kind of, from that, Jon Snow actually became... Mm who was going to save the day, but obviously it wasn't, you know, because... Like, like, this is the last season, and people want to see what happens to, like, Cersei and stuff. And I heard how she dies. That's crap. It was crap. She like, she had, She's, like, Lena Headey's just one of the best actresses. Like, everyone is amazing in acting-wise in that show, but I think Lena Cersei is just so compelling to watch. She, she has such, like, innate charisma. Like, I cannot look away from her when she's on screen. She doesn't do anything this season. She no, she, looks, she looks she, out a window. She looks out a window and has, like, maybe four lines of dialogue per episode in the episodes that she's in. But yeah. this, this was it. Like, she's also dumb because she's like, no, it's fine. Something will happen. The dragons, I'm sure. <laughs> and yeah, no. it was it was just, it was very disappointing. People are disappointed. They should be. How, how do you feel about Bran being the king? So I think Bran, Bran is like the internet. Yeah, no, he like he, he, he is a computer. He's like Dr. Manhattan. He's just a cold, emotionless he's processing the, he's the machine. He's the sum knowledge. He's the sum of human knowledge. So he's the internet. So we made the internet our fucking king. But he's so cold. I think that's why he's so good because you've just had, like, very emotionally driven. But Cersei was a bad queen because she was she wasn't compassionate to her people, and then Daenerys was meant to be a better queen because she had compassion for people, and that's why she freed them like from slavers and shit. So then to be like, here's the robot boy, <laughs> like... Well, see, like, the thing is, like, King Robert had that as well, where he was compassionate, and he started a rebellion, which made him the king, and he wasn't a good king either. I, I do think just having a server at the very top, but then, like, the council is what, who actually run the kingdom, and they just pass on information. I, I really hated that scene where they were all picking, like, the king, because it was like, they all kind of... <laughs> So like, I really so, like Sam's suggestion about a full-on democratic nation, and they all laugh at it. Yeah, that's so weird. And so then, like, they laugh at the idea that like the people should elect their own kind of person, and so it's this, and then 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 it's just completely accepted that like you know the leader of society is just going to be picked by the most powerful people in society, and it was this really tone deaf moment. I felt like that's super dark after especially after turning doing the heel turn with Daenerys yeah 
There's this writer for WCW called Vince Russo, and Vince Russo is famous because he he did a lot of interesting angles in his day, but he also got really famous for basically being like, and then Hulk Hogan hits him with a chair right at the end of the match, and he's a bad guy. And everyone's like, why Vince? And he's like, it's cause, because cause we gotta swerve him, bro. And he would end every show with a swerve, which meant long-term, WCW's storyline made no fucking sense at all. Like, you'd have people heel turn, face turn, heel turn, face turn, heel turn, face turn, to the point that it just, nothing made sense. That is this season of Game of Thrones. Is this the worst ending to a season you've ever seen, or is there something you've been more disappointed by? I've got two shows. They both aired, they both ended in 2014. How I Met Your Mother and Dexter boat dexter sucks dexter is one of the worst endings and it's yeah. so weird because michael c hall is also in one of the shows that has one of the best endings six feet under yeah totally. six feet under i think is the perfect ending of yeah a TV I, think, show. I think it's my favorite tv show ending ever yeah i absolutely love it it actually it actually this this the end of game of thrones made me respect the end of breaking bad more because i don't i don't really don't like the end of breaking bad but just like the fact that you have an underdog slowly turning into just the worst person in the world yeah and then he kind of like tried to make up for it in the end and i guess now i can appreciate that because game of thrones was so unsatisfying but then i think like one of my favorite endings ever was and i know you hate or you haven't seen have you read sopranos i have i've watched all sopranos i love that ending so much it's so great and so weird and i still think about it i will never think about the end of game of thrones ever (laughs) no did you did you finish Broad City? Yeah. The, yeah, I, I like the last episode of Broad City because the camera pulls out and Abby and Alana are telling you know talking to each other, but there's loads of other besties around New York with their own storylines. Oh, lines. that's sweet. Yeah. I, it's a no, like I, I like those kind of endings where it's like they're not going for anything big, but they just put a bow on it. Yeah. Uh, Kimmy Schmidt's ending was nice as well. That felt like it tied up everything, and it was the last couple was, episodes of yeah. Kimmy Schmidt were real strong, weren't they? It was really great. Yeah. It's a pity. I'm really sad. But I mean, like, as well, like, the value to me in a show is always going to be how I feel when I'm watching it. And Game of Thrones gave me so many good memories. I find it hard to be really, I guess, furious about this. It's more just very disappointing. I feel like my plan to watch it in a month's time has totally backfired. Because now with everyone's palpable disappointment, I'm like, oh, do I even bother? What if you like it? I don't think I will. I, I not probably, with the way Cersei dies. Like Jamie I mean, and I knew Cersei. Sleep together. Ha- that's fine. That's fine. If that's not fine. I think that's okay. I think that could be cute. But it's like, not. <laughs> Their relationship in the books is so much weirder. What really? Oh yeah, because like in the books, Brienne is she got captured by Lady Stoneheart, and then Lady Stoneheart manipulated her to do something, and so now she's met Jamie outside of a forest, and she's like, "Come with me. I know where uh, Sansa and Arya are." Awesome. That sounds great. Um, at least for everyone who's disappointing, there will be a book. And the books are good. The books Very are, good. I love the books. They're so dense, much. but like they're still great. Like they're yeah. a lot of fun. And the audiobooks are pretty good. I like Roy reading them out in his weird Tyrion Welsh accent. Brian, could you do Tyrion's voice in the audiobooks? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's me, Tyrion. Wildfire. Tyrion's like hideous in the books as well, isn't he? His nose is chopped off. Yeah. In the show, they just gave him a scar, but he has mismatched eyes. Uh, so like they're like an inch like on parallel to each other. Swollen head as well. Yeah, yeah. He's got a swollen head on one side of his head, and is yeah. The front he of his nose. He can also do backflips in the book. He's very good at tumbling. Uh, but Tywin did not appreciate the tumbling. No. And, and he's <laughs> that all, would have made that show so much better I really wish I, I, I love Peter Dinklage doesn't... so much as Tyrion okay I have one more really tiny this is a real petty complaint this is stupid just a mean John just thing a mean say. John in the last episode whenever or in the last couple of episodes whenever anything's happening with the Lannisters they play a song called The Reigns on Castamere oh yeah they do The Reigns on Castamere is my favourite part of Game of Thrones. If you know the story behind the Reigns on Castamere, it's such a fucking good story and it's so representative of like this of Tywin Lannister. Just Tywin Lannister, no other Lannister. It's his song and it has a very like special meaning towards him. And so then they keep dropping it into minor and playing it whenever anything sad is happening to the Lannisters and it was so like that's not what this song is about. This isn't 
this isn't a this isn't like the Lannister anthem. This is a very specific song that Tywin plays when he's about to fuck someone up, and I really hated how they used it in the final season. And I felt like that kind of them not understanding what that song was about was kind of just emblematic of them not understanding Game of Thrones. That was very nerdy of you. I can't help it. I, I understand where John's coming from with that. No, I, I totally get it. It's a character theme and they weren't using it correctly. You gotta get the subtleties right. I just miss when Game of Thrones was like, you had all these people being dickheads to each other and they were all manipulative, manipulative and backstabbing, but they were all stupid because the Night King was coming and that was the real threat but they were all too caught up in their own bullshit to realize it and that was the point and now it's not do you think they should have done the battle for um they oh they should have done king's landing first first and then the night king last i i i kind of feel like they should have because like the whole idea is that like and george r R. martin is very open about it is that he's like well it's a metaphor for global warming you have yeah. all these countries at war, and there's a bigger threat that they all that we all need to like. Yeah, I, I don't think you have get. to. You have to read very much into it to get to that at yeah. all. And yeah. so they solve global warming, and then they just go back to just a weird squabble. But I guess yeah. the way you're saying it, Neve, it's like they could have their big battle, and then it'd be cool if like maybe they survived the light night king, but there's like nothing left afterwards. And then it's like, yeah, you made your point. We all shouldn't have fucking squabbled. Yeah. Yeah. Neve, why don't you tell us about the next item on your list? You gonna say it? I'm gonna say extremely wicked, shockingly evil, and vile. This is the Ted Bundy Netflix movie. <laughs> so this was meant to come out on Netflix, and I was, I was like, cool, everyone's watching that. I shall watch it. It wasn't on UK and Irish Netflix. Yarg. It is a Sky Cinema exclusive over here, which is like digital broadcast TV. You need to get a box and it's a subscription service. Time to go on Pirate Bay. Uh, I went and saw it in cinema. Oh my God. It had a limited release over here in the cinema. So Leave, buddy. What are you doing? I, <laughs> I had a that. free ticket. So and you didn't go see Detective Pikachu. It wasn't in the cinema I had the free ticket for. That was the problem. I had to go see fucking Ted Bundy. <laughs> anyway. God, Ted Bundy is such a fucking thing now, isn't he? Yeah. And, like, this movie has the weirdest cast. This is the Zac Efron Ted Bundy vehicle, I guess we're calling it. So it has Zac Efron. We know him from High School Musical. We got Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. (laughs) We got Haley Joel Osment, the child from The Sixth Sense. Oh, the boy whose, like, face doesn't fit his head. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Once you see him, you're like, oh, that's the... Okay. Um, We got Effie from Skins... Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> and we got Laurie from Buffy. That's our cast. Who? Sorry, remind me who Laurie was. Oh, she's in, she's only in it for a few scenes. Um, her name is Angela Sarafan. Um, God, she was a very minor character. Okay. I can't even begin to describe her to you. Anyway, weird, weird cast. And every time someone comes on screen, you're like, hey, that's blah. That's <laughs> Sheldon. Because Sheldon just plays Sheldon, but a lawyer. Anyway. This is a biographical crime thriller about Ted Bundy, the serial killer. And it is by the same director as another Ted Bundy uh, film on Netflix called uh, Conversations with a Killer, the Ted Bundy Tapes. And that's a really, really good four episode kind of documentary about Ted Bundy and how horrible and scary and deluded he was. And just how, what a vicious, horrible killer he was. It's very informative. It uses uh, footage from the time and it's really interesting. This movie is from the perspective of Ted Bundy's longtime girlfriend, Elizabeth Kendall, and his subsequent arrest and his trial. It is really framed around, because Ted Bundy was this charismatic guy, like we're all told, that's why Zach Efron is playing them, who could convince people he wasn't as much of a threat as he was. He was, like, caught with, like, rope and gloves in his car, you know, and managed to kind of slip out of that conversation. He was a master at charming people. And you know all of this when you watch the documentary on him and you, you know, read up about Ted Bundy or you just know about Ted Bundy. When you watch this film, I guess the idea is that he's so convincing that you start to doubt it. 
because the way this the angle it takes is maybe he's innocent and if you don't know anything about ted bundy you could kind of come out of this film and be like i wonder if he did it which i think is terrible way to approach a ted bundy like this guy's fucking a terrible horrible serial killer i wouldn't mind if they do that until like the last scene where they're like no 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 like they kind of do that at the last scene. They? they go, here's Ted Bundy's victims, and they like make a like two column list of his you know, victims. Eve, I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, both sides, you know. But that's kind of what it like. It felt like, and like it's just Zac Efron's character that trying was not to a convince, serious comment. trying to convince his like his his wife who he'd gaslit that like he wasn't a killer, and like he there's this book that he keeps reading about this guy who was falsely accused and he's like gifting it to her and he's going on about the being falsely accused consistently and it also just shows like how he was kind of like wooing the court and even the judge when he's got giving his closing arguments he's like oh well son i wish you didn't go down this route you know i would love if you were a lawyer and standing in front of me in a different situation and this was all true shit that was said to him but it's just the angle the film takes is exceptionally strange to me and like the if you go in knowing ted bundy's a killer then you're going to be like okay i see what they're doing they're kind of showing the manipulative face of him but if you're li- like limited not knowledge of him it's just a weird stance to take like my mom watches serial killer crap as well and we were talking about it and she was just like she was like for a moment i found myself thinking maybe he didn't do it and that's so messed up. Like, I think that's really wrong of this film I to think kind of take that angle. I think it would be fine if Ted Bundy weren't a real person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he, who, like, actually yeah. slaughtered a bunch of women. So I really don't think it works as a biographical, like, uh, film at all. Especially after watching something like The Act. And it's very, like, it shows the manipulation it shows that there was sometimes love there in its own horrible fucked up way but it also completely highlights and is focused on how horrible it was you know and to have this kind of play it this romantic maybe he's not uh, like you know maybe he is innocent and maybe you know it didn't feel like he was manipulating us it felt like maybe it was true I think that was a weird a weird angle to take i also think it's not a great looking movie this is a fine movie for a tv i saw it in the cinema it's a lot of mid shots they don't want to pull that camera back and show that it's you know not 1970 so it's a lot of close-ups and Zac shots um it's yeah. i love okay. zach efron he does yeah, a good job good. he does a good job do they try and portray ted bundy as like a heartthrob yeah thing? Yeah, he, they really do. Like, he's like, there's a really, like, there's a sex scene with him and his, like, wife. And it's really like, oh, man, this is so hot. I think I think that's that's a bit, like, I understand he was a very charismatic man. But I think, like... It's I think, boyfriend I think, serial killer material movie. Right. That's what it feels like. And again, like, okay, this dude was real and killed mm-hmm. a bunch of women. It was it was a it was a weird decision. I didn't like it. I thought it was a bad movie. I thought the acting was good from everyone in like everyone involved gave a good show i guess but i don't th- i didn't like the material Ted big thumbs up there for me so don't check it out no watch the watch the uh, the other uh documentary the confessions of a killer yeah and that is, that is a really good documentary mm-hmm. um okay and with that we're going to move into our strategy talk <laughs> Hello again. This is just Brian. I am using one of our older microphones just because it's uh, beside me here at my desk. Uh, I don't think I've used this microphone in about two years, maybe maybe three years, but I thought it would be nice to kind of go back to our more humble beginnings. Um, so I don't apologize about the audio quality because this is what it used to sound like. Where to start? Um, I'll go before the podcast when I first met John and Neve back in college. I started college in September 2006 and I went to animation college and John was in the same year as me. Uh, He was maybe a year or two older than me because he had done a portfolio course the year before whereas I had gone directly from school and 
we were outside the cafeteria and I ended up talking to John and a third person about Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door, which is one of my favorite video games ever. I remember thinking at the time, this, I, I don't think I've ever spoken to anyone about this game verbally. I think I'd only ever spoken to people about it on message boards online. So it was so cool to just talk to another human being about a very specific video game. It went down super well, and the third person in this scenario just sort of walked off. We never met this person again, but it doesn't matter because one year later we met someone way, way better, and that was Neve. Uh, Neve started the year after us in 2007, and I particularly remember her the first time because we were at the local pub beside our college, and instead of ordering a beer, she ordered a glass of wine. I was like, who's this sophisticated person? That's that's crazy and I guess now it's uh, a bit of a let's fight a boss tradition to have wine uh, I was intrigued by her and I always wanted to be friends with her and I'm super glad I am now jumping ahead then to June 2015 and that's when we recorded our first episode of let's fight a boss back then the show didn't have a name and I think we even forgot to introduce ourselves we talked about E3 that had just happened just giving our kind of thoughts and opinions on upcoming games we didn't really think much of it. We kind of just made it for ourselves and for our small group of friends to listen to at work. Uh, but I guess we really, really enjoyed it because we sort of kept doing it. And little by little, we kind of got better at it. It took about 30 episodes to get the hang of it. And at that point, we'd been doing it a year. By then, we had upgraded our audio equipment. I think the first thing we used was my iPad. We used the built-in microphone and used the memo app just to capture the audio and then convert that to mp3. Shortly after that, we used my laptop, the microphone that I'm using here, and then John started being a YouTuber, so he got a Blue Yeti microphone and we started using that. And then when we launched the Patreon, we ended up getting more professional audio equipment and that's the setup we use now. I still can't believe we're doing this. It's so weird to think that I'm part of a video game podcast. Uh, it's not something I ever imagined I would do, but it's something I look forward to every two weeks when we record one. I don't know where to go to from here. You know what? It's actually like super weird just talking all on my own. It's really hard to kind of keep thinking of what to say next. Uh, I've actually gone back and re-edited all of this over and over again. Um, and I guess that's just because I do need John and Eve to be there with me. We're all kind of each other's support when we do this show. I really can't do it without my uh, podcast husband and my podcast wife. They're super important to me. And it's not until you do something on your own until you realize how difficult it is to do it without them. I don't think I could do this podcast with anyone else. I think all three of us have strengths and weaknesses, but it's kind of like a rock, paper, scissors situation. If one of us can't do one thing, the other one can, and the other one definitely can. John, for example, he's the host of the show. Um, to me, he's kind of like the backbone. We've done one episode with, without John, and that was super weird because we didn't know when to kind of like move on to the next thing. You kind of need someone kind of steering the show the entire time. Then with Neve, I kind of see Neve as like our secret weapon. She tends to offer um, a different perspective on uh, a video game or even just like a general life experience. And, and I never would have thought of it that way if not for her making the observation. And then we get these unusual moments sometimes of overlap where we all kind of agree on something. And we kind of get this epiphany. <laughs> I really, really like those rare moments uh, between the three of us. Okay, I'm going to leave it on that note. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Let's jump back to episode 100. Okay, Brian. Yeah. You've been playing Banjo-Tooie. I have. Uh, I recently finished Banjo-Kazooie and I moved immediately on to Banjo-Tooie. Um, the other day I was talking to you guys about how when you play the sequel to a video game you're reset back down to zero and you have to recollect and relearn all your abilities and 
your upgrades are gone and it's that kind of suspension of disbelief or that that kind of breaks it the logic sometimes where you're kind of like but this character overcame all these problems why do i have to do it again shenmue 2 all still unlocked baby perfect video game so banjo tui also does this banjo tui oh no, like the way i would describe the banjo tui is that i've never played a game where it is a literal direct continuation of what you were doing in the last game because the first level of banjo tui which is a 3d collect them a platformer the first level of this game is more difficult than the last level of the previous game yeah i i remember when i played it i thought it was really difficult it's an overwhelmingly huge game and the only way to like digest this game because it is a fucking main course is to have the starter that is banjo kazooie beforehand like it's such a big game that it needs a prologue in the form of another game (laughs) um I'm really, really enjoying it. Uh, I'm, I'm about 75% of the way through the game, but now I'm in the tough collectibles. And from those rare N64 era games, the last quarter of those games when you have to, where, where you've got to start collecting jigsaw pieces that you've left till the very end, that's where it gets tedious. So one of them is uh, in Jolly Rogers Lagoon, which is the pirate level, there is um, a swimming pool and it is full of cold sewage water and two pigs can't swim in the swimming pool because it's toxic and it's too cold so what that means is and this is how you get the jigsaw puzzle you have to go to the factory level but the way you get to the factory level is because the shutter door is down in the factory level you have to go in a train via a different level and get the train to the interior of the level you explore the factory level and you get rid of the poison Meanwhile, you do another level where you're up in the sky and you talk to an ice cube. You push the ice cube off from the sky into the lava level in which it melts in a hot spring that turns into a warm spring, which is perfect temperature for the water. And then you fill the water into this level via that level. Then you can finally get the jigsaw piece. Brian, that sounds insane. Yeah. I really like it. (laughs) I mean, yeah, that's... That's kind of cool. I really want to know how they developed this game because there's so many logistics. But like, it's not like Donkey Kong 64 where you have five characters with color-coded buttons that you need to press in a specific order. No, they've actually like creatively done it. Yeah, and so like it feels like an escape room, but as a platformer where you need all these pieces of the puzzle. Uh, um, across like a million different stages. Across many different stages that you have to do sequentially. And if you don't do it in the right order, because sometimes uh, I, I, I was doing one puzzle and I was like, okay... I can do this step, and then I realized I didn't do step before because I started on step three, and I was trying to do step three, four, and five without doing step one and two. So if you push the ice cube in before you got rid of the poison, it wouldn't work? I think you could do them in either order. Okay. But it's just the fact that you have to do all these different logistics in another level just to solve one puzzle. But then, like, some of the other puzzles, it's just like, oh, you go into a temple and you just, like, have to shoot 20 bad guys. Sure. Because it also has first-person shooting, because it's from the makers of GoldenEye and Perfect Dark, where Banjo holds Kazooie like a gun, and it's in first-person mode, and it plays real fucking nice. I don't like to think too much about, like, Kazooie, how Kazooie shoots the eggs, because I start to get really uncomfortable. Yeah. But, but it kind of brought me back to thinking about Mario Odyssey, where, like, the moons are everywhere, and, like, the effort you have to go to to get a moon could just be as simple as ground-pounding exactly where you start at the beginning of the level. Yeah, I hated that. And just some of the, like... The fucking hoops you have to jump through to get the like collectibles yeah, in this make, game. Make me work for it. You, they really fucking make you work for some of them, and there's some interesting experiences. And this is a game that I haven't played in about 18 years, but some of it was just burned into my memory, and I knew exactly where to go. Still, that's crazy. Probably uh, sign a good level design though. Yeah, um, I think if you play it now, I wouldn't recommend it. I think if you've played it as a kid and you want to revisit it, it's, it holds up. What are you playing it on? Xbox 360, but it's also an Xbox One. Cool. There you go, Neve. You have an Xbox One. I got rid of it. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She she beat Banji Kazooie and she couldn't do Tui, and it was just, that was it. Okay. Guys, I played Hollow Knight. <laughs> Finally. Finally. My favorite game. Yeah. I really like that game. I played 50 hours of it. I don't want to play it. I like, I don't like, I like that game. Mm. Don't like it. I love this game. Yeah. I love it so much. You definitely love it and nothing else. Yeah, nothing else. I, you were so conflicted. Yeah, I don't like the precision, like, kind of 
controls in that game but i love everything about it yeah you know what if those if those controls don't like click with you i could understand how frustrating that is because it plays like super meat boy maybe a little tighter than super meat boy yeah 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 because he's way slippery in that game yeah but there is a lot of hopping there's a lot of hopping um i i have put off playing hollow knight for a long time for two reasons one i thought like yeah it seems cool like maybe not anything that really blow me away which yeah it looks fun and two, I know getting lost is a big part of that game. And I have trouble getting lost, like, in regular life constantly, all the time. I don't like getting lost. It's a very frightening feeling for me. And I only need to wander, like, maybe, maybe like, 10 meters away from somewhere that I'm used to in order to get lost. It's very bad. And frequently, I will get lost going from point A to point B, a journey that I've already traveled, and lose my way, and that's that's it for the day. Sorry, Michelle. Um, Nancy, please. Nancy. But I have really loved this game. I love it so much. It's like, I think the world in it is so fascinating, where it's like, you know, you basically go down, like, this well... And it's just this gigantic city. Like, it's the idea that there's, like, you know, an ant's nest, but, like, it's much bigger than you think it is, and it just keeps going and going and going. And each section, even though each section is basically, like, underground bug lair, they all feel really just distinct and interesting. There's, like, the weird mantis village or, like, the tower where all these people, all these crazy bugs have, like, sacrificed their soul for, like, weird power. Yeah, I really like the one where it's like a garden. It's like a private garden that has like acid bats everywhere. Yeah, and it's just it's so interesting, and the music is so cool, and like I really love the animation and like the look of the enemies. It's so nice, and it's weird because before I played the game, I'd seen a sh- like shit ton of this on YouTube. I watched Joseph Anderson's videos on it. I never thought it looked that visually appealing, but for whatever reason, when I'm playing it, I think it looks amazing. And um, it's just real tight controls. I There's a lot of like slamming into bosses and trying to beat them over and over. But I also think the bosses are maybe a little easier than something like Dark Souls. Like I can beat them. I beat the bosses in this easier than I do in that. And I've just been shocked at what a good time I'm having with it. I, I like how customizable your like build is where you can play. You, you can like get rid of all your health, but you have like amazing attack boost then yeah 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 and you 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 can you can recover to a point but then if you take a second hit you can't recover that that life anymore totally and like um it's just one of those games where like i'm constantly thinking about it anytime i have a spare minute in the day i go play it and it's it's great it's a really really good game i can't wait for um i can't wait for hornet's game yeah there's a cool girl in it called hornet and she's I don't know what her deal is. I don't really know. I can't really piece together too much about the story right now. There isn't that much. It's 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 all left to interpretation. Okay. That's just it's just that's a bug village with it, or a bug city and the surrounding areas that just have this I awful don't know. infestation. All the have their like little lore and stuff. That's kind of nice. Did, did you find the hive, the honey honey bee hive? Not yet. No. <laughs> Very special place. Okay. Because awesome. there are because there are a bunch of optional areas like Dark Souls. Yeah. And they're very satisfying to And they've added a bunch of free DLC onto it? Yeah, it's mostly boss rushes rather than exploratory stuff, um, which kind of suits some people's needs, not so much mine. I like. Yeah, I don't know if I'd care about the boss rush stuff, but it's it's a great game, and I really was not expecting to enjoy it this much. Neve, speaking of a game that you've been enjoying this much, do you want to talk about Days Gone? I do, very quickly. I'm still playing it. I'm nearly done. It says here, Days Gone with a sad face beside it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Um, everything me and Brian said about it last week is still true. <laughs> uh, it's improved somewhat in the sense that uh, I finished the third camp. I am now into the fourth camp, which again locks me out of all the trust I have kind of... Camp trust I've completed in the first areas and now I have a new camp trust meter to build up to unlock things. But I've unlocked a lot of weapons and the the gunplay is the best and most enjoyable aspect of that game. And the more stocked you are with guns and the more stocked you are with ammo, it makes that game way more fun to play. 
Um, it is it is it is behind an unbelievable grind, and I really think that game would would do well with an editor, like just being like, no, it doesn't have to be this grindy, and like the open world missions you do to grind are so mundane it's like a question mark symbol you go there there's a man trapped in a car with some freakers around them or there's some human enemies around a guy and you kill them and you get your ex you send them to a camp and you get your xp there's two models they use for those people that you find in the world oh no just two ex- just yeah. that's it two models with about four voice lines through all the time i've played this game 40 hours wh- wherever i'm at with it now it's just those two guys. I'm constantly saving them, constantly screenshotting them because I keep finding them. <laughs> and it's like, why? Why is the good fun of the gunplay behind this boring, boring grind? Um, the story has... I don't know what... Like, Rebecca said, like, what's the story of the game? I guess at the start I would have said to find Sarah, to figure out what happened to your wife. I found Sarah. She's fine. <laughs> There's still more game. <laughs> she's working with a bunch of mercenaries or something? Yeah, she's working in a militia camp, which is the fourth camp, which is also a militia camp run by kind of a religious nut job who sends the people who he doesn't think is good enough to fight. And that means not subservient and, uh, and not like able bodied. Just they're not willing to bend to him. He sends them to a slaver camp. So that kind of seems a little backtracking on Deacon's whole, like, maybe that's wrong kind of arc, because I thought Deacon would kind of push back against him, but he's playing the good soldier boy right now, you know, saluting and just like, yeah, been in the army before, I know how to be a good boy, and just won't push back against any anything that's happening at all. The narrative thread I'm on right now is Sarah's trying to make a kind of neurological bomb to kill the freakers and she's in a race with this other guy who's trying to make a napalm bomb to kill the freakers i am doing quests for both of them and (laughs) that's that's where the story is it's like there was a there was a bit i guess that i will talk about uh the characters you the lesbian couple you meet in the third camp one of them decides to cheat on her girlfriend and try and get with deacon for absolutely no reason I he's can really hot though yeah, I guess they, yeah sure lesbians do love sleeping with men and it's just like the most awful of tropes for just like lesbians in general it's like you haven't met the right guy his name's Deacon St. John and Jesus Christ <laughs> God this, yeah or, no, that's awful that's, that's really like, shitty even if Ricky is like a bisexual woman worst bisexual tropes like a, a bi woman who cheats on her same sex partner with a man the first yeah, time it's, she it's gets. still kind of like a shitty statement on lesbianism oh yeah well totally like the the twist is that like that sets them up as a lesbian relationship and that's the twist and the weird thing is as well is deacon is more committed to who his wife who he thinks is dead there's a little bit of flavor text and he was just like i'm just you know i'm i'm into sarah still like i'll never let her go (laughs) really into dead girls and it's like it, it never comes to light ricky's always radioing him being like deacon let me get the D. <laughs> and like she's like propositioning him constantly. She doesn't say that, does she? No, she, she doesn't. Okay, good. <laughs> she's like, uh, but she's like proposit. She says, "Come to my like." She's like, "Come to my cabin." Like she- she's propositioning him constantly, and he tries to cold shoulder her by being a dickhead. So he's just like, she's like, "We need to talk," and he's like, "We're talking now," and she's just like in person, and he just hangs up the thing on her so he's just constantly giving her the cold shoulder but then her girlfriend nearly gets her um, throat like sliced and then the girlfriend realizes that maybe she shouldn't be with Deacon and be with her girlfriend instead cool rad story yeah rad story why was that in it why have a lesbian couple if you're gonna do that with them why have that in it at all it's just Deacon St. John is so fucking cool and it's just such a stupid bad fantasy and it's shit are there any redeeming qualities to this game neve the shooting i couldn't even say the enemies because the enemies are the freakers you get some more uh beefed up freakers and they become more like common out in the open world later on as you move in there's some crows they're just another way of burning out freaker nests you just burn out their nests with molotovs in the same way you do that wait what like crows as in birds yeah crow nests 
They're right. the kind of new enemy you re- meet in the fort. Are, are they like fort freaker camp. crows? They're kind of, yeah, they're kind of freaked up. Okay. Okay, so you just shoot up instead of parallel to you, you just point the gun up. You can't right. really shoot them while they're in the air okay. unless they get very close to you. It's more about you burning out the nests and getting XP for that, like you were burning out the freaker um, nests. Okay, so you don't really. You don't sh- interact with them. They're just, they're kind of an annoyance to kind of go through the world. Uh, the the most difficult thing to beat in that game is a bear. That, yeah. That's it. They're the kind of thing you um, need to look out for and that will take a lot of ammunition and a lot of your health. Um, yeah. There was, a, there was a twist in it where a bad guy, the ripper leader was a guy called Carlos, but then he turns out to be a guy called Jesse. We've never met Jesse in the game. They've never spoke about Jesse in the game. And there are flashback cutscenes. There is flashback cutscenes. They've never mentioned this person. And then the guy walks into the room and is like, do you know who I am? And Deacon's like, Jesse? Why? How does that work as a twist if the player doesn't know who that character is? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, me and you and Boozer, you know, we've history. Never. I didn't hear about it's it. It's me, Deacon. Your best friend. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. It's so strange. It's like, it's just terrible writing and it continues to be. Uh, I'm enjoying shooting things. I am nearly at the end. I really want to see it through to the end because I've gotten so far and I can't wait to play something else. Fair. Brian. Yeah. Do you want, do you want, do you want to know about a game you should I want to know about yeah. some <laughs> Devil May Cry 5. Yeah, I'm playing DMC 5. Um... This is my first time I'm really properly playing a Devil May Cry Cry Cry, Cry Devil May Cry Cray Cray game. Um I played the HD collection and I was like, this isn't Bayonetta. It's not. No. Sure ain't. Step back. It's probably it was probably a step forward at the time in two thousand and one. Big time and like you know, Devil May Cry one was a long way from Bayonetta. Yeah, like that was a that was many years between those two. So I played a bit of it, and I was like, "Look, I missed the train on this one. I missed the boss. Like, you know, it, it, it's just going to be something that I, I can watch a video about and be like, yeah, I guess that was a really important thing." But I got to play Devil May Cry five, and I have no context for anything in the game. It's fucking brilliant. <laughs> I don't know the con. Some people are very into like the story of Devil May Cry Five or Devil May Cry in general, like the lore and stuff. And cool, awesome. I wouldn't necessarily say context is going to make the game much better for you. Nope. No. Nope. Everyone you go into, it's kind of nearly tells the same story anyway. They're all supermodel demon hunters. That's all you need to know. Yeah. Yeah. Dante it's- has beef with Virgil. Yeah. Um, so I'm halfway through the game. I finally started to get to play as Dante because for the first half we do not get to play as Dante. And I just started playing as him and he got, and he turned uh, an enemy that he was fighting into into a motorcycle, then jumped on the motorcycle and made the weirdest fucking face at the camera. Just this like, like the face that Joey in Yu-Gi-Oh makes when he's like got his fist up in the air. Yep. Just looks right at the camera and gurns at us. I love this game. <laughs> yeah, I, it's really good. And I've actually gone back to it recently. And I've been playing Trent. I've been failing to get through the Bloody Palace. But I am having such a good time doing it. So is the Bloody Palace like a side mission score attack? You're going up on one continuous life? So you start off floor one. Yeah. There's a lot of floors. Work your way through them. Each floor is just... It's the same, it's the same arena. New enemies. Okay. Um, and it only works because Devil May Cry 5's combat system is so fucking good, I'd say to the point, it's the... I think it's the best character action combat system that's ever been. I like it better than the Bayonetta combat systems, and I love Bayonetta. Wow. Yeah. And so, you, you like playing as Nero the most? Nero Nero is my 100% favorite. I really... I don't get Nero at all. For me, he was like... He's like stuck in mud the entire time. To get the most out of Nero, you have to learn to use his Devil Breakers. Like, yeah. you can't just rely on guns and swords. You have to, have to, like, know the different moves with the Devil Breakers, know what situations they're good in and what situations they're bad in. And he's so much fun when you do. I could show you some wild shit with Nero. Okay. Yeah, because, like, I find it kind of interesting that, like, for him, the camera's really, really up close behind his back as well. Yeah. Because of the way his fighting style is. 
but then I guess the guy I like playing most as is V. For him, the camera is zoomed out loads because of all the like real time strategy stuff you're gonna have to do with him and the two other animals sometimes the third animal the golem and you see i had the opposite experience to you i played as v and i was kind of like this is fun but i don't really know what i'm meant to be doing and i had that sentiment right up until i played the game with rebecca and neve's girlfriend and like from the shit she showed me with v it's like oh man there's a lot of crazy stuff you can do with v and that was really really interesting to see and made me have more respect for the game because it's like i feel like there's just so much you can do with it and like dante have you played as dante yet yeah yeah dante i think there's he nearly has the most stuff going on out of any character yeah he does he's got four different stances and all and and like he can parry yeah and he gets more (laughs) and more he gets more weapons and it's crazy but yeah i love i love um nero just because I love like I love like working your way through his different arms and like the way you fight with the different arms is totally different and it's just oh, it's an amazing game like and it's only raise, rising in my estimation as the year goes on and I'm still playing it. Yeah, I was really really impressed by like the polish and presentation like it's beautiful isn't there's it? There's so much subtlety to it. Like even the way like V reads his poetry but they have all these different animations for like whether he's like running around reading it or walking or standing still but they always find a way for him to kind of like put it back in his pocket yeah it's so cool and like when you clear the game you know the way you get the idle screen of everyone just like hanging out in the van yeah when you clear the game you get like a whole set of new idle screens and some of them are really good one of them is just like dante and virgil just sitting on the couch just being like (sighs) (laughs) and it's great and oh the soundtrack is so the music's amazing. I really like Nico's uh, like workshop music as well. Yeah, it's such a really, chill really song. Good. I, I, I've been listening to the soundtrack a lot. Uh, I got a pro tip for anyone who's playing Bloody Palace a lot. If you have Spotify, go to Spotify. You can pick all the songs you like from the Devil May Cry soundtrack. So that can just be Devil Trigger if you want. And have Devil Trigger loop on Spotify, Spotify as you play through Bloody Palace. And this means you can listen to Devil Trigger when you're not playing as Nero. But also, the way Bloody Palace works is Devil Trigger starts and then you go into the portal and Devil Trigger ends. There's a lot of Bloody Palace stages that take about 15 seconds, which means you're going to hear the start and end of Devil Trigger a lot. But this way, you get to hear it all the way through. Sweet. Pro tip. Whoa. Yep. I'm really glad you're enjoying it, Brian. I think that's my favorite game of the year so far. Wow. Yeah. I'm really, really impressed with Capcom this year. They've really turned it around. I want to see a Street Fighter from this Capcom. Yeah. Will you finish Resident Evil? I really was not enjoying that game at all. It's like seven hours long to get through a campaign. I just, it's, okay, I'll finish it. I'll finish it. Finish it for you, Neve. But like, I, I really, I have to state like, I don't hate the game at all. I, I think it's what it what it's doing, what it's doing. It's doing well, and people like it, and that's great. I just don't like what it is. It's the perfect version of what it is, and I don't like it. You can force your way through a hundred hours of Persona Five. You can force yourself through six, seven. How many waifus can I seduce in Resident Evil? One. It's Leon. Ah. <laughs> he's pretty hot. Yeah, no, he is pretty hot. Although I think he's hotter in for previous two. I don't like his new uniform. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we all got we all got our stuff, you know. Um guys, what say we move into our quick time events? Hello everyone, it's Neve with my hundred episode message. This was John's idea, obviously. He's very, very good at being sincere, and I'm sure his message is extremely heartfelt. I bet Brian's message is going to be freakishly accurate with dates and numbers and stats, and that's going to be really interesting. I don't know what mine is going to be. I'm probably going to just ramble for a few minutes and see where that gets me. So uh, my apologies if this is bad. I don't know why we decided to do Let's Fight a Boss. I'm going to say it was my idea, because that seems like... (laughs) an idea I would have. (laughs) I'm going to say it was my idea because Brian and John aren't around to debate me. So I don't know why we started it. I don't know really why it works. I don't know why people listen, uh, but we did start it. 
it does work and people do listen. I can only presume it's because it's fun, because that's what I get out of it. I get endless fun out of it. Before we started the podcast, all we would end up doing is talking about games and those conversations were always so fun to me. Not because we agreed, but because we disagreed or because I, I, their, their perspective and what they liked about games was so different from mine. And that's genuinely what I love about Let's Fight a Boss is being able to hang out with my best friends and learn about them and just know why they like things and why they dislike things. And even to learn about myself, about why I like things and dislike things. I don't think they're opinions you're meant to agree with. I think it's just a conversation you're listening to. So you can be like, man, that's a lot of bullshit, but because it probably is. <laughs> Um, but that's that's the great thing about the podcast is I think I I've got to grow with these two people like with Brian and John I've got to grow with them for four years and like figure myself out and figure them out in a really intimate and interesting way through a shared hobby and that's just been like super fun and enjoyable and it's never, it's never a burden, you know, I never think, oh shit, we have to go record the podcast. It's like, oh cool, I can't wait to tell my friends about the thing I like. And that's, that's just been a really nice experience to be able to have that and to be able to share it with other people. I also love that we drink a lot of wine while we record. Sometimes John doesn't partake because he has like his fight boy classes at 6 a.m. But uh, me and Brian, we like to have a little fun with some wine. I guess outside of the fun I have recording with the guys, it's just been cool to watch like a community kind of spring up around the podcast. And I don't know how we've managed it, but we've managed to cultivate the nicest, most supportive community. And I guess when I started out, I was a little apprehensive um, being the lesbian on the podcast because you know what the internet is and you know what video games can be like on the internet. People aren't really receptive to that stuff sometimes. But I don't know how we managed it. We have just cool listeners who I really feel have our backs and are just been endlessly supportive. I've had some really nice emails from my fellow LGBT and I'm really glad if me being open and out on a podcast has helped in even the most minor of ways. And I know what that's like. I've known I've I've known how hard it is to find representation or a voice that you can be like, yeah, they kind of get it. Uh so if I can be that for anyone, like that's that's a big deal for me and I'm really happy I can do that so yeah I'm just gonna wrap this up and just with a really heartfelt thank you to our patrons people's generosity has kind of blown us away and like thank you for allowing me to do this with my friends and I'm I really hope you enjoy the podcast I I hope it makes you laugh <laughs> I hope I hope you have fun and as far as the future of Let's Fight a Boss, I hope we continue to do this for as long as we can. I'd love to do more video stuff this year and we've got a few things in the works and I hope you're all there to check it out. So thank you and uh, back to the episode. Okay, okay. Uh, Eitri is upon us very soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we have no good news. There is literally nothing happening. I pulled stuff. <laughs> like, I really tried. I was scraping the bottom of a barrel. So here, here is that bottom of a barrel. <laughs> Tell me Progerid is not here. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm not touching that I, stuff I, with I, a pole. I, I don't think we need to get involved in that. John, don't get involved. I won't get involved. I've got nothing to say. I don't know those people, and I don't care. <laughs> I have been following it too closely. Neve, what we got? Um, first up, we got the Sony State of Play. This is Sony's version of a Nintendo Direct. Oh, that's right. So, ten minutes long, they highlighted some games. First thing up was Monster Hunter Iceborne. It's DLC for Monster Hunter World. It's a cool ice level. Looks There's fun. a lot of snow. It looks pretty cool. Um... 
Then there was Predator, Predator Hunting Grounds, which is an asymmetrical uh, game, hunting game. Okay. You know, yeah. one of those. All right. And then we got Away, which is... <laughs> oh, the squirrel game. It's a, it's a sugar glider, but uh, <laughs> it's a sugar glider <laughs> game, which also, they're nocturnal. That was all set during the day, but okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> if you're going to do a sugar glider game, like... Get your fucking back straight. <laughs> there, there, there was one girl at work who had a pet sugar glider. Really? I was like, I, and and she was like, I f- no opinion. <laughs> of the game or like sugar gliders? Just sugar gliders. They're, they're not good pets. I don't know. I'm not, like, Because like the concept is fun, but imagine one flying into your face. Imagine this weird wing skin going into your mouth. Apparently. <laughs> why are you trying to? Wait. <laughs> I like the idea of it just like coming you just have your mouth open being like, uh, oh, like it's a No, peanut. you get in the front door and you're like, man, what a shit. <laughs> okay. Okay. So sugar gliders are tiny mm-hmm. and their cages are huge. They have big, tall vertical cages and you look in the cage, can't see it. It's not. It's not a good time. Yeah, they should just be in wild. I think they're illegal in a lot of places to own as a pet as well. They are. Yeah. Uh, they're like, they're from Australia and I think Indonesia. Uh, anyway, that was a game about sugar gliders where you get to play as one, and there was a great scene where it's on the back of a deer while a forest burns, and I was just like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Game. They spent a lot of time showing off the sugar glider game. Yeah. Then uh, medieval remake. Okay. Or medieval, whatever you want to say it. I, I have never heard anyone say they should remake medieval. Nope. I I remember when I first got a PlayStation that was like the demo disc game. And like I think one guy at school owned it and we were like, isn't any good? And he was like... I've never heard no opinion. anyone bring up medieval on like a podcast... I've never seen a video game essay about medieval. I've never just I, I've played it. I don't remember it, but I've played it. Same. I like his design, how he's a skeleton, but he's got like a bug eye. I thought this kind of like based on say like say Spyro remake and stuff like that. And Crash. That that game looks pretty good. Like uh, this one, I wasn't really too into it, too into the look of it. In the trailer, like, did, did we get an email from medieval fans saying they were disappointed? I d- well, if, <laughs> if if we did, we're answering it right now because I thought it looked kind of bad, mm. design wise. Okay, there we go. But um, yeah, I hope that's good for the people who want it to be good. I didn't really pay attention to the trailer. And that was PlayStation State to Play, and nothing else big <laughs> happened there whatsoever. Oh, Neve, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's even kind of true. I think something else happened. I think something very predictable happened. <laughs> something that anyone could have seen coming if they just used the slightest bit of logic. Or even just look back at Square Enix's history. <laughs> they showed, um, to everyone's surprise, really, because it's a state of play. <laughs> Why would they do this here? They showed an extended trailer uh, with gameplay of Final Fantasy VII Remake. A new trailer of Final Fantasy VII. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that sticking in my mind as something? Something important. Was it one of our predictions? It sure was. Brian, it was one of our predictions, and you guys were such fucking dickheads about it. <laughs> no, we weren't. We were just like, John, do you do you think that's actually going to happen? You were like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I went back and I listened to it because I wanted to soak in the just joy of you two being <laughs> so wrong and you, you were just so bad. I and know. I wasn't even going to make you pay about this until like actual next year, but now Neve's made it too tempting and I can't help myself. Um, you can pay all you want, I don't give a shit. Here's I'll like, fucking like queen. I honestly thought, yeah, maybe you will. I think I fucked up this year really bad. I think you did. I think I did. <laughs> um... It's. I kind of thought that Square would push Kingdom Hearts 3 more this year. I thought there might be DLC news, but I guess not. I guess they, that thing's just dead. A lot of people have been asking me, am I going to stream more Kingdom Hearts 3? And my answer is, the thought of playing more Kingdom Hearts 3 makes me really sad. There you go. Yeah, what do you guys think of this? Uh, yeah, it looks cool. Um, I don't trust Square Enix. Yeah, mm. yeah, like, 100%. They, I, I, I do not, like... You know how this company is like Activision, and you're like, they're bad, evil companies or whatever. Mm. But like, Square Enix is a company where it's like, it's it's not about them being bad or evil or just something like that. It's just like, I don't 
believe the product they show is the product they will deliver at all. Yeah, I feel like they're very mismanaged, especially with Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts. I think this looks bad. <gasps> I think this looks genuinely bad. Nanny? I think this looks like a bullshit Final Fantasy 15 mod. Oh, 100%. The battle system's the same thing. The battle system's the same thing. All the characters have that fucking, like, lith, like, super just everyone's tiny fucking JRPG look to it and like oh god even the changes they've made the scene with the scene with Eris and like she like dances around Claire this is for you and like tries to give him a flower that was just the fucking Lyra scene from Final Fantasy 15 like it's the exact same tone and everything about this game is the same and it's easy to look at this trailer and be like this looks stunning Wow. You know what else looks stunning? The trailers for 15. They're fucking incredible. These trailers for 15 are some of the best trailers ever released. They are amazing. And it's this fucking dog and pony show all over again. And everyone's like, oh, I guess this one will be good. And in four fucking years, I'm going to have to make another fucking 50 minute video. Okay, no, look. That's <laughs> insane. I think the character models look all right. Like I, I, I think they look nice. I think um, in the way they were shown in the trailer, in the specific lighting of the trailer, they look really well. Mm -hmm. I don't think they'll look like that in the game. They didn't show Tifa either. They're they're gonna show her at, at like E three one hundred percent. Like that's what's gonna happen. They showed her meter in a battle, but she was off screen, probably oh, doing God something. damn it! What do you think of the, our chances of getting like buff Tifa? Oh no! Zero. Yeah, like. It's going to be a very gaunt, frail, like, you know, dandelion of a woman. Yeah. Kind of, yeah, given, like, again, Square with, like, King Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy XV, their female characters were kind of garbo, and they're usually better than that. Eris looked very pretty in it. Mm -hmm. She really did. But, like... I think, I think this looks bad. I think the tone is completely off. Like, nothing about this has Final Fantasy like seven to me and if i'm wrong i will happen i would be delighted to be wrong about this game like i will eat my word because i'm i'm buying this game obviously games yeah games. that's the thing that has me the most worried is that this is still going to be episodic and they're planning on selling them this is the rumor i they haven't confirmed this but that they're going to be full price games so that means whatever one comes out first like is that going to come out on ps4 hardware yeah. Like, PS5 is around, like, the corner. Like, what is the crossover of these? That's interesting, yeah. Uh, it, does this mean they're going to stretch out Midgar as its own game? And this, I really hate this because, like, it's, like, the beginning and the middle of the end of the game is going to be separated. And, like, this isn't a trilogy. This was a one story. Like, are they going to add new characters? Are they going to add new character beats in to make it have its own kind of yeah. narrative conclusion each time? And I've been playing through Final Fantasy VII, and that game's tight. Like, at least the sections I, I've played through, I'm just about, I've just left Midgar where I am now. But Midgar is like, it's good and it's tight and there's interesting stuff everywhere, you know? And it never, I never felt like it was dragging and it's just, it's great. I don't want a full game of Midgar. I think what I love about Final Fantasy games specifically is the journey on the change of locations. I like traveling places. I like seeing, like, the shift in, like, just the industrial nature of Midgar and the shift as you go through the game and how things just visually change and the idea of just spending it all in one place like not very appealing to me my worry about the episodic thing is that there's going to be a lot of criticism based on the first game of this and I'm sure some of it will be valid a lot of it will not be mine sure won't be but square is going to scour every bit of feedback and put it into the next game and the next game after that and it's going to either delay or n cause them never to be released and it'll just be this unfinished disappointing cake i think that would be the case even if they didn't take fan feedback yeah. you know what i mean like I feel like all we've seen is Midgar. They probably haven't touched anything yeah. else. And like I, even even the it's, stuff it's, they've it's, yeah, shown, it's, like it's it's just going to be funding for the next game that they don't have the security. Stuff, the stuff they've shown is literally all stuff from like the first thirty minutes of the game. <laughs> they got nothing. They got nothing. I think it looks bad. Um, I love Final Fantasy VII. I love that game so so much. It's the tone of it that kind of puts me off more than anything else. This just. 
this game so far still feels like Final Fantasy 15 and not a huge fan of that game so yeah Neve what else we got <laughs> I got it here some other video game news okay go on it's the slowest of weeks everyone Robert Pattinson's gonna play Batman <laughs> <laughs> put that in there oh boy uh, uh, so he's definitely playing Batman I, I think he is oh, yeah. yeah I think so that's he's, cool I really like Robert Pattinson yeah I think I think that's a cool idea um, I love him in the David Cronenberg movies I love him in Good Time uh, he's had a really interesting career he's amazing in Good Time yeah actually you know yeah yeah this is this could work fine his new film The Lighthouse is getting crazy re- good reviews as well I thought it's really crazy how like everyone on the internet was just kind of like accepting of this and just no one had any like weird problems or anything (laughs) people are so mad at this and it's just so nuts to me because like okay you had the human chin himself like play batman in the last few movies who was not great i didn't think yeah and it's just fine he looks like ben affleck he looks exactly like he probably should but i mean what did that get you? I don't know. I like a little more beef on my Bruce Wayne. Um, I think it's cool. Like, I think it's an interesting take. I also think, you know, what all the Batmans up until now have really focused on the Batman part of it. And I don't know. I think they kind of fall down with the billionaire playboy who's really charismatic Bruce Wayne aspect. Yeah, I agree. And I think maybe Robert Pattinson is someone who could appeal in both cases to yeah, people. Yeah, because, like, Christian Bale, like, when, oh, he's a sexy billionaire. Like, blah, blah. <laughs> like, no. He was and then, very, like, very good as Batman, but yeah, as Bruce Wayne. He was crap. He was just someone in a car. Yeah. And then, like, Ben Affleck, again, looks like Batman in the suit, outside of the suit. Like, just, like, no charisma. Just crap. Uh, Robert Pattinson, I think, can just, like, do a Bruce Wayne and a Batman. I think if people are really skeptical about him, they should check out some of his most more recent movies, and especially Good Time. Yeah, Good Time, Cosmopolis, Map to the Stars. What What's the other one? Lighthouse? Water for Elephants. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> he got really attached to the elephant while I, making that movie. I can imagine. He seems like he likes And then animals. he had to cry when he left. That, that weird Sal- Salvador Dali movie that he made one time. Where he, pl- he played a young Salvador Dali. That wasn't the movie that people were like, critics hate this movie. Uh, everyone hates movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, He's grand, leave him alone. Yeah, no, he's fine. He's, he's a decent actor. Um, Sony opens PlayStation Productions to develop multiple game franchises into... T- oh, wow, I didn't hear about this. It but, is exactly what it sounds like. Are we getting our medieval TV show? Uh, seemingly, this is based on a report from The Hollywood Reporter, and its first slate of projects are already in production. The new studio is there to make blockbuster films and television, and it's to kind of leverage its links with its like sister company, Sony Pictures. Um, here is a quote from Sean Layden um, of Sony Interactive. When fans beat a 40 to 50 hour game and they have to wait three, four years for a sequel, we want to give them places they can go and still have more of that experience and see the characters they love evolve in different ways. So we haven't heard what franchises they're going to be looking at. What do you think we're getting? They cited Marvel as something they're basing this off, so they kind of want to expand out universes. Do you want to do like an Uncharted? Uh, yeah, Uncharted, I feel, is definitely something that would happen. The Last of Us, because that that's just... They, they could do that. Do you know what I'd like after Detective Pikachu? And it's never, ever going to happen. I'd love a Smash Bros. movie. Hey, we got an email that might, you know, just okay. saying. Okay. Okay. What Sony property would you like to see? Um, see, there's a Bloodborne comic book that I haven't gotten around to yet, but I will. Is it by the same guys who did the Dark Souls comic book? I don't know. I'm not that's sure. not meant to be great. The, the Bloodborne comic books are meant to be very good. I've seen yeah, some sample. Great. I've seen some sample pages, and I was really impressed. Um, so I don't. I don't need that. Like maybe like a four episode Castlevania Netflix thing, but done for Bloodborne would be kind of neat. But also, no, I'm fine. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything where I'm like, yeah, I need that. It's like, no, no, it's okay. Uh, Four episode Bloodborne thing, though, that that could be cool. It could be cool, but it could just be like, you, you, you know how there's a Bayonetta anime and nobody's seen it? Yeah. Could be like that. Sure. I'm trying to think of Sony IP that like... God of War. <laughs> a God of War. Uh, you know, we wouldn't like that. Other people would. 
it would do very well. I'm sure yeah. someone out there wants a Kill Zone animated series for whatever <laughs> reason. Someone wants Horizon Zero Dawn because people love that game. They do, don't they? They do. They really love that game. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just think when I come when it, when it comes to Sony, a lot of the IP, I'm like Parappa the Rapper. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I want Parappa the Rapper in the style of the Gregory Horror Show, just like forty one minute episodes. Sweet. Okay. Neve, what else we got? Uh. <laughs> this is the other one. Uh, Nintendo will shut down Animal Crossing Fire Emblem mobile games in Belgium due to loot box le- uh, legality concerns. Fair enough. Yep. That's exactly what it sounds like. Here is the Nintendo statement. Due to the current unclear situation in Belgium regarding certain in-game revenue models, we have decided to end service for Animal Crossing, Pocket Camp, and Fire Emblem Heroes in Belgium. It will therefore no longer be possible to play and download the games from Tuesday 27th of August 2019. So uh, Belgium declared loot boxes were gambling back in April 2018, so it's taken a while for them to, I guess, pull these games. But so did the Netherlands, and they haven't pulled the games from the Netherlands. Weird. And a bunch of countries have come out and been like, Loot boxes aren't gambling, including our own. Yeah. Weird. It's weird a weird shit. time yeah. for this thing. I think they are gambling, and I think there needs to be a real level of responsibility around it. Yeah, and I would much rather see like responsibility as opposed to regulation, because regulation is good for no one. Yeah. Well, like, in the games industry, historically, at least. Yeah. No, you, that, that shit needs to be parental locked yeah. as best as can be. Yeah, slow week for news. But don't worry, E3 this year is going to be a fucking blast. Yeah, we've got so many big companies at it this year. There's so much like hype already from like journalists. I just want. I'm just waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. I mean, new Xbox console. Days gone too. Uh, Honestly, no. Actually, never mind. No, (laughs) no. I'm sure. I'm sure Nintendo are going to announce those. Two or one, one or two revised switches that are for solely portable or solely uh, system. Uh, With system. Nintendo for me this year, it's very much like show Bayonetta three or admit that that game's like in a weird place. Yeah, because it's put up or shut up time. Yeah, don't show Mario Maker two because it's out at the end of June. That's a waste of breathing room. Have it on, have it to play at kiosks there. Yeah, Let that's people, it. That, yeah, I don't need to see another video of it. It could be on screen for five seconds as part of a montage. I'd like a 30-second story trailer for Astral Chain. Yeah. Yeah. I want a maximum of 45 seconds of the new Fire Emblem It was game. Square Enix that took the Sony stage slot. Wow. So they brought us, like, the quiet man last year. <laughs> Jesus. I frequently forget that The Quiet Man happened. I like it was in my bathroom and I just thought about Imogen Heap doing the song for that game and I felt really oh, suddenly sad for wow. her. <laughs> Man, although if if they announced another game that takes place in the Quiet Man fictional universe, <laughs> we'd all play we'd fo- we would we would do a video of that. Like we would. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be an interesting year. I don't know what's going to happen. Me neither. Guys, what's why you move on to some emails? Hey guys, this is John. Um, this is me recording my message for the 100th episode of the Let's Fight a Boss cast. And we wanted to do this, I guess, just because kind of, we wanted to do something like a little special. And um, I guess it's rare we kind of get to give like our thoughts on the podcast outside the podcast. And so I guess we we thought this would be nice. Uh, Sorry if this is a complete rambling mess. This is like totally unscripted. But um. It's really weird thinking back now to like when the podcast started and I think the weirdest thing about it is like I have no idea what was like the onus or inspiration or even why any of us thought it would be like a good idea. I mean when I look back now like the idea of starting like a successful podcast especially like 
when no one has a clue who you are. It, it's like really difficult. But I guess... I guess we didn't really care because we just thought the like doing a podcast would be fun. And as it turned out, it was really super fun because otherwise we wouldn't still do it anymore, for sure. I guess the thing I think about most when I think about the podcast is like, um, I guess just Brian and Neve, honestly. Um, I think in a lot of ways, like, I'm really lucky that those guys are my co-hosts because um, when, when like I started, I had no kind of concept of how to even do a podcast. None of us did. And I think we've all developed a lot in our own ways. And I think like it's been lucky because like as it turns out, Brian and Neve are pretty much like two of the most funny, insightful people I know. And so, like, I'm so lucky that, you know, we were all on board with doing this and that the chemistry just kind of worked out. And I think of, like, you know, what I really enjoy about the podcast is just, like, getting to really properly catch up with those guys, like, every two weeks. It's been a weird experience, like, growing closer to them as the podcast has gone on. And I guess just, like, feeling the different things they bring to it. Like, I'd say Brian is one of the funniest people I've ever met. Like, I... (laughs) Brian really makes me laugh with his kind of, like... I don't know. I wouldn't even call it a dry humor, but he just has this really outlandish sense of humor. He makes kind of jokes that I would never make or think of, and I really like that. But I think... And, you know, he's... As anyone who listens to the podcast knows, he's, like, an incredibly charming person. But I think under that, like, he's also very insightful. I think he has a way of, like, summarizing something in a way that I never really could. He's also just, like, I think great at improvising. I feel like um, when I'm hosting the podcast, I can basically throw Brian any random bullshit and he'll always take it and run with it and it works. And then, like, with Neve, um, I think out of the two, Neve was the one I knew less when we started. Me and Neve were friends and we had like started to get close but I guess I hadn't really spent like the quantity of time with her that I'd spent with Brian and definitely getting to know Neve has been like a really super interesting thing over the course of the podcast. I think she is probably like the most intelligent person I think I know. Like she's razor sharp in a way that kind of I nearly find kind of intimidating sometimes But I think, like, offsetting that, she's also one of, like, the goofiest people I've ever met in, like, a really super endearing way. And um, I guess getting to see, like, like, like getting to see that side of her come out as we kind of kept doing the podcast was, like, (laughs) it was really, like, it was really sweet. And... You know, none of this is me saying that Brian and Neve don't actually annoy the living crap out of me both of them do you know but I think they do in a way that kind of feels like siblings a little bit and I don't have any siblings so I don't really know what that's like so I could be wrong but I guess when I think of it those two are probably the closest thing and um I've really had a blast doing 100 episodes with them like I really really have and you know here's hoping for many many more right everybody emails did you know that we have an email address really yeah huh do i know it can i try guess it okay what about like ask let's fight a bog at gmail.com almost yeah it's ask let's fight a boss oh jeez at gmail.com ask let's fight a boss at gmail.com okay not hotmail not hotmail not yahoo Okay, what about Yodel? Nope. Really? Not even Ask Jeeves, Jeeves. Ask.com G- uh, email service. It has to be Gmail. Okay. Ask, that's for the boss at gmail.com. Brian, what do we got? All right, this first one is from Ace. The boss cast has been cursed by a passing witch. Oh, God, not again. She makes it so that you can only listen to tree songs for the rest of your life. What, what song? 
What songs do you pick? Okay, do you guys have an answer? Uh, I'm trying to think. Well, um, okay, I, I, it, it's kind of hard to think of tr all three songs in a row. So, I, and, and I guess it has to be like a gut reaction kind of like. Yeah. I got my three. Okay, go. Wow. Sticker Brush Symphony from Donkey Kong Country 2. Okay. The live version of Nine Inch Nails is Hurt with the spooky crowd noises. And Bomb Funk MC's Freestyler. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In a similar vein, mine is uh, the music from Hailfire Peaks in Banjo Tooie because I really like that. But done by a brass band, children's choir in the north of England because there's a very good video on YouTube. It's a very specific one. Okay. They do a great rendition. Okay. okay. Uh, Eiffel 65's Blue. I knew you were going <laughs> to pick that. I knew you were going to pick that. Well, you pick Freestyler, so I got it. Yeah, okay. but Freestyler is actually a good song. Okay, and then I want Apex Twins' Window Liquor. That, yeah, that sounds fucked. Brian, up. your your selection, and I like all the songs. Your selection kind of worries me. Yeah, uh, I've okay. been cursed. Deftones, Passenger, Simple and Clean. Yes, Simple and Clean, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kate Bush running up that up that hill. D is the Deftones Deftones Passenger is on White Pony? Yeah, man, it's like the worst song on White Pony. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, that album's like amazing. There is no bad songs on it. But how what could the you? Fuck? How could you pick like that over Digital Bath or Back to School? I like the story it tells. Back to School isn't White Pony, but it does come in at, at the end of Change of the House of Flies. It does, yeah, because yeah. it's on the EP Mini Maggot instead. Yeah. What's wrong with Passenger? I'm a passenger. I can't believe my songs are the ones being treaded here. Wow, it's like Chino's in the room. <laughs> hey, Chino. <sighs> yeah. Like, that's the song they ran out of ideas for. Okay, this next one is from... <laughs> this next one is from Felix. <laughs> okay, what's up, Felix? Uh, after the Patreon is shut down due to undisclosed reasoning... <laughs> oh, God! Your PR manager, Father Gascoigne, decides the only way forward is to sell Let's Fight a Boss merchandise... <laughs> What sort of LFAB merchandise would you sell? I'd like to start start off with a couple ideas. Uh, the Oh No, I'm Gay t-shirts, uh, coasters, bags, and the Sextina, the clown, pop vinyl. He, he's kind of nailed it I there. think we need to hire this guy. I want, like, bat salts, and I want John bat salts, and I want Neve bat salts, and I want Brian bat salts. Could you describe the different bat salts? Okay, the John bat salts, you put them in, and it just makes the bat pitch black. And like it kind of stings your skin a little and you're like maybe it's supposed to sting and then you kind of like you feel better afterwards you don't <laughs> it, you get a rash okay <laughs> the knee of bat salts you start you go into them and it's just bright red and it's not like blood red or pink or anything it's just like like a, like a like very unnatural red. like you get, get, <laughs> not you know, found in nature yeah just just not yeah because because red is such an earthy tone this is not that red at all. <laughs> and it makes you feel really cold, which is not the color you associate with red, but you are freezing. You are shivering in that bath. It does great wonders for your pores. Mine, you, you, you go into it and it's pink. But after five minutes, it changes to the color of poo brown. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, and, that's, that's it. And the way my bath works is for the first five minutes, it makes you smell so good and you come out so fresh but if you stay in the bath too long you get punished this is what I feel like it's like but that's what becoming friends with Brian is like because Brian when Brian's luring you in he's so nice and he's so friendly and he's so polite and then you're then it all just turns to shit then <laughs> bam you're stinking of shit yep have you got anything? um I don't know I really like that Sextina is <laughs> um Getting more merch. Hit us with some more like sextina merchandise. Uh, blow up doll. <laughs> how, 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 how like uh, a costume, just for you know for. Dave, what's the sextina costume? <laughs> it's just a full, a full red clown wig, uh, makeup, uh, Hong Kong nose. It's just a bra. <laughs> <laughs> how <laughs> how a, tall are the stilettos? Oh, very very tall. They're like eight inch stilettos. Yeah. 
She sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Okay, how, 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 how about a stiletto to clown crack pipe? It's just got her face on the side. Fine, or a bomb. Stiletto to clown. <laughs> Oh, did 16, 16 is <laughs> drug addicted sister. <laughs> Let it rip with 16. <laughs> Do you want official Beyblades or anything? Yeah, I think our heads on the Beyblades would be pretty good. Yeah. yeah, that'd be good. Do you want like an official John fruit? And like it's a specially grown fruit in a lab. <laughs> But it's got. It looks like John's head. Oh, it's like those baby pears. Yeah. Oh, they're scary. But it's it, like the pears that are grown to look like a baby's face. Oh, I don't okay. like that. And so it's got John's stern face looking back at you. Grown into- <laughs> Fair. Yeah. Yeah. John, do you have any merchandise? You got the. You got two fucking t-shirts, don't you? I patch both t-shirts. Yeah. Really, like, yeah. 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 That's not. That. That's. We don't talk about that shit here. Okay, but uh, so like like if we were to do like a do you know what um, I, I you, you know how Neve has a design and my girlfriend Rebecca has a design mm-hmm. how can we didn't use my design because it was a wolf sucking its own dick that wasn't the other okay so okay so here's my pitch for John's third fan gamer super eye patch wolf T shirt okay God I hope fan gamer don't listen to this hey guys hear me out. It's John from a three-quarter back angle, right? And it's him sitting on the toilet. And you can see full ass cheek. And it's him looking at his phone. And the phone screen is kind of magnified in a speech bubble above the phone. And it's him looking at his stats on Social Blade as his YouTube subscriber count is going up. And he's going, no. (laughs) No. (laughs) Okay. Just take that t-shirt and just put let's fight a boss below it there's our t-shirt <laughs> oh great question okay thank you felix have you got one no that was good brian leave you got it there one? oh or, wait no oh what, 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 that's how you're talking about more merch oh yes yeah, sorry i have um an email uh blowjobs and other things what uh <laughs> hey boss crew wait uh, i heard john mention before that he started taking uh bj classes I just happened to Neve. <laughs> starting BJJ classes at the same time. That's not what that and means. I wanted to know how it's going. Personally, I love learning new te- techniques because <laughs> it shows you can use knowledge of physics <laughs> and human anatomy to disarm or submit an opponent in a simple, energy-efficient ways. I also love the sense of challenge as I try to climb the rungs of the belt procession ladder. <laughs> In BJJ. So, so does... In each uh, class, performing the techniques feel more in- instinctual and it really makes me proud to go home after a, day's, a hard day's... <laughs> I hope uh, I hope to have my first white stripe in June. For Brian and Neve, do you have any challenges that you're working on for self betterment? Uh, how has the progression gone so far, and have you learned anything about yourself in the process? Okay, first of all, thanks, Miles. Neve apologized to Miles. <laughs> BJJ. So the second J. Okay, people does that call, stand for? Uh, this is why I don't call it BJJ. Everyone's like, you're going to BJJ. You're going to BJJ, and I don't want to say that because it does sound like blowjob. Not that I have a problem with no, that. No. I was in a loving, consensual relationship with someone who wanted one but i'm not and i don't and that's it wait but it doesn't that's does the second j stand for jam josh or joho or john <laughs> no it stands for brazilian jiu-jitsu he should have meant that clear he does he does. i know uh, but sorry, G- Miles. bjj <laughs> um neve brian do we have any things we're working on for self-betterment any challenges no i <laughs> don't drop your Neve, fucking phone you are a fucking train wreck this <laughs> episode <laughs> she, she's got a real case of the giggles um, I, I'm awesome I don't need to get away. I don't need to improve in any capacity yeah, same. oh I see I am so deeply ashamed of what I am I am constantly struggling to improve <laughs> sometimes I think about working out and I'm like you know whenever I tell you about out. like if whenever I say anything about like working out or how I work out, Neve, you get so like appalled. <laughs> I don't know. People who work out are like, oh, it's really transformed my life. And I'm like, I don't care. Yeah, but you could also just sit in a chair. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much better. Awesome, um, awesome people. Is there anything I've done for self betterment? Like, honestly, no. <laughs> no. Nah. No, I'm fine. 
How about you, John? Do you, do you, do you want do I talk about your weird strict life of punishment? And no, because every time I do, people latch onto it so hard, and they come up to me at cons and like. <laughs> like make fun of me for it like seriously that happens all the time it's no one's business how often I eat it doesn't matter how many times I exercise yo I don't want to tell people my yoga routine <laughs> and you also meditate yeah I meditate that's so cool I it's yeah, just it's to, super cool I wish I could meditate but I always fall asleep it's just to keep the stress levels as low as possible which for me is still exceptionally high i can't imagine anything more stressful than meditating though because like if i go into my head whoa you don't want to be there you're not going into your head man you're going out of your head do you think about like energy going on going all the way down to your fingertips and your toes or what do you do um yeah like sometimes you kind of you like to start off you can just like put your hands down and think about your hands and just try and think about like the sensation in your hands like actually like trying to feel like the nerves in your hands and feel the blood in them Ooh. and stuff and it does just take you out of whatever else you're but thinking. it makes you think about being a human and being no, alive Niamh, look this is just fucking and you and you're just weird and <laughs> awful have have you ever sat there and gone back in time to yourself as a child <laughs> giving yourself advice and then you return to your present form and you like you feel better because sometimes I do that yep yeah what? I, do, I do that all the time yeah you can't do that yeah. guaranteed to someone else who's like Brian gets it you guys just can't do what I can do I want to answer his question about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu go on what was the question <laughs> he was just asking how I'm getting on with oh, it oh yeah how you? Uh, really really well <laughs> it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is a really really good martial art it's really hard uh, you get choked out a lot by people and that can be really disheartening especially in the first couple of classes where you really really don't know what you're doing but um it's also really good and i honestly think the world would be better off if everyone a learned martial arts and b got their head kicked in a couple of times because it just it teaches you some humility and i think that's important and i'm kind of at the stage now where i've been doing it for a couple of months and it's really starting to click in some cool ways. And like this week especially, um, I've, you know, I, I was up against a lot of the other white belts and I noticed like they're starting to like a gap form between me and the people who just started. And I can really make their lives hell for like three minutes. And that makes me really happy. Cause I just, you know, there is a lot to martial arts about like discipline and self-improvement. But at the end of the day, I just really like hurting people. You know what, in terms of self-betterment, I think as a growing experience, I think everyone at some point should work retail. Oh, yes. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think if you've never worked retail, you have not experienced. Oh, God, yeah. I had an experience yesterday morning. It was... What's her name? Michelle's name? Nancy. 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 It was Nancy's birthday. And I wanted to pick up some donuts from my favorite donut place. And I went in and there was a guy melting down on the two people behind the donut counter. And he was like, I want a ham and cheese sandwich. And they're like, we don't serve ham and cheese sandwiches. This is a donut shop. And then I walked in and he comes up to me and he goes, you're the fucking owner, are you? Like he was just a crazy person. And I was like, no. And then he just turns around and goes, is this guy the owner? And the guy's like, no, that's a customer. And this went on for like three minutes and I was just standing there waiting to order my donuts and then he left and the staff were like, I'm really sorry. And I was like, it's okay. It, it, it teaches you a lot of empathy. It teaches you a lot about humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Any self-betterment I've done has always just been artistically and that's it. Definitely not personally. No. No. <laughs> no. Okay. And that email was from Miles, and I just want to say to you, Miles, personally, your Gmail icon profile photo is amazing. Miles, thank you so much for that email. That was great. And look, good luck with the jujitsu. The BJJ. Hope, hope the rolling goes yeah. well. Okay. This last one is from Serena. Okay. And it's hypothetical. Okay. So, and this was something you were kind of talking about earlier on, John. Uh, we're given 100 million euros and have to use that as a budget to make a film, regardless of what the content is shown and shown worldwide so on and so forth um i'm gonna put one caveat on it because it's too wild too wide too wide yeah. so let's say it's a video game movie okay street fighter alpha 3 the ormiki chronicles 100 million dollars 
Is it live action? Is live it action. Okay. Is, is it going to use a lot of VFX or is it going to be an old school? So many VFX. Okay. It wouldn't be an old school, you know, martial arts. You movie. know, if I had my choice, I would actually probably do it in the exact style of the Street Fighter 2 animated movie because I love that movie. Whenever people are like, this is the first good video game movie. I'm like, watch the Street Fighter 2 anime, you fucking nerd. <laughs> do you have a video game movie, Niamh? Um, I was going to say Sleeping Dogs, but that's being made into a movie. Yeah, really? it is with Donnie yeah. Yen. Oh, mm-hmm. weird. Yeah, uh, that'd be cool. Mine is, I want a stop motion Kirby movie. Hell yeah. I want Studio Dwarf to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want it 88 minutes long. That's the longest it needs to be. I want it to be made out of uh, like actual material. Like It'd be cool if it was felt or Kirby had a texture to him. And I just want their visual trickery of like actual physical stop motion blended with VFX that they do. And I want it dialogue free. And it's just this darling film that does well critically and commercially at uh, at the box office and the festivals. Can Kirby have a friend like Rilakkuma's Karu? <sighs> See, in you Kirby, need some way to make to make him interact. Um, he would probably have his companions like Waddle D and King DDD would be a bad guy for the first five minutes, and then he would be a good guy. Uh, there would there would be bigger bads as the story evolves. But I don't want to add any original characters like they do with Kirby right back at you because they kind of take away from. Stuff I like about Kirby and I think others. So it's like an 88 minute film with no dialogue. Yes. Cool. Okay. I, I'm down. I, 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 I'm kind of hoping it's going to be like that with the Mario movie that Illumination are doing. I just do not give these characters dialogue. Make them fucking Charlie Chaplin around the place. That's all you need. I just want like corporal acting. No dialogue, please. They're making Tomb Raider a second one, so I'm, I'm pretty are good. They? Yep. You know what? That first movie, good movie. Okay, mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. Okay, okay. Then here's the other one. You've a hundred million euro. Pitch us your Days Gone movie. No. Plays- Everyone's a lesbian, and that's just it. it replace every man in that with a lesbian. <laughs> okay, it's the exact story of Days Gone. All plays out shot for shot, except we do it in live action. But right at the end, Deacon turns to Brewster and he says, "Bruiser, Bruiser, <laughs> Bruiser, 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 Bruiser." Bruiser. 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 He turns to Boozer and he just says, Sometimes I feel like humanity was the real monster the whole time. Cuts credits. He might actually even yeah, that say... Might be <laughs> that, that could potentially happen in the finished game. I think that might be too much self-reflection, though. Um, I would love a Bloodborne movie. Oh. Mm. I, I like that world. I want to see those costumes. I want... Uh, what's her name? Sandy Powell, the costume designer of The Favourite doing oh, yeah. that oh yeah 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 she'd like, do a great job i want to see that world rendered in live action i don't know what that story would be i don't know if it would be good i just want see, to see that's that. the tricky part because i feel like as we've seen in sekiro when when a souls game is directly explained it's not that compelling um I wonder if it would work, like, I know it's kind of, like, bad timing, but if HBO were to do, like, a Bloodborne eight-episode series or something like that, would that be good? And it's ten million per episode. Did you see that, um, what's his, J.R.R. Martin? George, George R.R. Martin. Yeah, he's... Grum. Grum. <laughs> Grum. The car. Grum is, uh, seemingly working with FromSoft. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. As, as a... You know what? If you just take, like, Game of Thrones and you just make it spooky, you got Dark Souls. <laughs> yeah. Especially the last season. The bit where John goes up to Daenerys and the dragon, like, kind of, like, shakes himself out of from underneath the ashes. That was such a Dark Souls, like, boss. Yeah. Brian, you know when the dragon melted the throne? Yeah. Do you, do you get it? I got it because, like, he understood the metaphor of the throne better than anyone. So he knew it was absolute to melt it. But no, do you, do you get it? Like, it, it, I, I didn't get it. <laughs> How about you had a hundred million euro and you had to change one thing in Game of Thrones? Like, you, 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 you Game could of film. Thrones season eight, the Ormica Chronicles. <laughs> Cersei wins. I just want Lady, Lady Stoneheart to show up in it, but she didn't. A strong bellows. 
Strong Bellowis, everyone's favorite eunuch. Where is he? Where's Strong Bellowis? Where's Strong Bellowis? I've been asking this for four seasons now. I want a Milk of the Poppy cr- prequel. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Serena. Okay. Let's say we move into some Patreon shoutouts. That's right, this is the grovelly bit. Brian, I really want my message read out on the Let's Fight a Boss cast. Like, I need this. I need this fucking bad, okay? Yeah. I don't want to risk going to email because I know they get a lot of emails and I I just feel like mine's not going to get picked. That's probably not a good email. (laughs) Okay, well, no, that's not quite (laughs) the direction. That's not quite the direction we want to go here. (laughs) Okay. Oh, oh, I see what you're trying to go for. Yeah. Oh, well. We have this sort of method where we're obligated to read out whatever you fucking type. Okay, we're going to try and massage the wording of that a little bit. But it's true, if you become a Let's Fight a Boss patron for just three dollars, is that right? Three American dollars. It's like we're being robbed blind the entire time. Yeah. But for three American dollars, you will gain access not only to the fabled back catalogue, but also, you could have your message read out on air just like this. Grady Baby writes, maybe we were the podcast all along. That's spooky. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Ah, you know how it is. Yeah. We're all just pop culture vacuums. I guess so. Neve, you want to read the next one? Just a Ninja Owl says, we are finally cowboys is the only song I'm legally allowed to listen to. What the fuck is we are only finally... Is it, is it from Red Dead? <laughs> what he's referring to is that Let's Fight a Boss is a song from the No More Heroes soundtrack. And during the final boss fight of No oh, More Heroes, yeah. Travis oh, Touchdown yeah. fights his long lost brother. During which the track from Belfast. We Are Finally Cowboys plays. And it's a great song. Okay, and then this is from uh, Charybdis... My grandma wants you to know that you're all good kids, and she's proud of you all. Oh, seriously? Fuck yeah. That's Thanks. great. Thanks, Grandma. Grandma Cherry Dis likes us? That's so cool. Thank you, Grandma. That's, that's, a very sweet, that's a very sweet one. Anyway, we have a Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash LFAB. That's patreon.com forward slash LFAB. Do we want to say the other thing about our Patreon? We do. Guys, it's been 100 episodes. We've been thinking a lot, and we've been getting, like... I guess after the Shenmue episode, we got like kind of a lot of you know, positive feedback about that. I think we would like to spend a little more time on that kind of stuff, and we would like to do a full playthrough. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce new stretch goals to the Patreon. Once we hit 1,000 books, we're going to do a full playthrough. We don't know what, you, what yet. We have a lot of conversations. If you have suggestions, we would love to hear them. We might take it to a vote, but it's going to be a full playthrough of a game. Yeah, yeah. But what that doesn't mean is that it doesn't mean we're not going to put out any more videos till we hit a thousand. That's just something that, like, you know, we can take away at and, like, you know, we're cool, whatever happens. But it also ties into our next thing because we all have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Basically, the way the next couple of weeks fall is I'm kind of going away for a bit and um, I'm doing a little, I'm doing a little bit of traveling, and so I'm not going to be around the next time we're going to record. And so, but the thing about that is the next week is also E3. And so we've made the decision that instead we're going to push that podcast back a week so then we can cover E3 with all three of us. Yeah. So the week of Monday, June 10th, yeah, we will record an episode that week likely to drop approximately at the end of that week, which would be the 14th of June. Yeah. But that means there would be like where you would have a regular podcast, there's going to be nothing. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to be dropping a brand new video on the YouTube channel that week. Very much in a similar vein to the Shenmue video. I don't really want to say what this is. I think it'd be kind of just a fun surprise for people. But all I'll say is I had a very, very good time recording it. And I'm looking forward to what people think. It was it was cool. I loved it. <laughs> it was something all right guys what say we move on to our loot drop we fought the boss we beat him there's a couple of treasure chests lying around let's open them up and see what we got let's see what we got 
do you guys have something right away, or will I go first? You go first, Brian. Okay, uh, I have a podcast called The Game Maker's Notebook, which almost sounds like the name of another thing. Wait, is Mark Brown not on this podcast? No, this is nothing to do with Mark Brown. Oh, what? The Game Maker's Notebook is a podcast run by Ted Price, who is the founder of Insomniac Games, who made Spider-Man, and they made the Ratchet and Clank games, and the Spyro games. It's a podcast he runs uh, that he just does occasionally and invites another guest on, and it's usually another video game developer. So the most recent episode, and they're conversation-based, so the most recent one is him and Amy Hedig, who wrote the Uncharted games and directed them, the first three Uncharted games. And it's just her experience in the industry. There's a couple of other guests they've had as well. Um, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a good one to put on in the background. Cool. Um, so I got a special section from WWE Raw this week, and it's of my man, Bray Wyatt. And for the last couple of weeks, Bray Wyatt has been doing a creepy TV, kids TV show gimmick that's really odd and strange. And it came to a head this week when he kind of revealed where all this was going. And it was wrestling at its absolute stupidest and dumbest. And I, it was really weird and strange and unsettling. And I loved it. And I just can't wait to see where else this is going. Even if you don't like wrestling, I think this is like kind of a fun watch. So check it out. Um, mine is Cult Podcast. And it is a podcast about cults and by three comedians. And it is pretty loose, pretty fun. And you learn that, man, cults are happening a lot, and they're terrible. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, because like to me, it's like a thing that happened in the seventies, but like we know not to do it anymore. You never think of it still happening. Yep. No, there's it's all kinds of cults. They're on episode ninety-two. There's a lot of cults. Um, it's a really, it's it's it straddles the line of being really informative, really respectful, but also really funny. Um, so check it out. It might be you up, might be up your alley too. Are any of them tech companies? I haven't got that far, but I prob I would bet. I would bet your brother got kind of. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone knows anything about Mind Valley, I think that place is a cult. <laughs> That's a name, all right. That's a name of a cult for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, a hundred episodes. I can't believe it. It's fucking. It's bizarre. Hey, thank you for listening to us. This is, it's really, I think it's really great that we've made it this far. I think this podcast is probably one of the best things I have ever done in my life. And it makes me really happy that people are still getting a kick out of it. And you know, we really appreciate everyone who listens to it. Yeah, if this is your 100th episode or if this is just your first episode, thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Thank you so much. I never expected to have a baby with two men, but here we are. Our weird Jesus baby. fucking Christ. I, 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 no, I, I get it. I, oh, we I really get had it. a fucking moment going there, didn't we? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm imagining it on the table now. It's like five different colors. And it's not even speaking backwards. I just want to end this podcast and go home. Of course, of course you do. I, I'm not stopping this podcast anytime soon. Oh my God. Can we just end the podcast? I don't want to do this anymore. We can't end the podcast just yet. We gotta You're just contractually do actually obliged to do yeah. another hundred. You just got to, we just, we just got to tough it out for a few more moments. <sighs> Get into the groove. The music's playing in the background. Yeah. <laughs> you feeling it? <laughs> no. All right. I'm feeling it. Mia's feeling it. And you, dear listener, you're feeling it. I guess I'm feeling it.